I want to welcome you all here today and we're going to have formalities in a moment around welcomes but today is important in terms of it is a coming together of both the Indigenous Engagement Division, um, the team that I lead in the University of Queensland along with the Academy, Australian Academy of Humanities and we're here to uh, have some conversations and critically examine and reveal what constitutes Indigenous studies today and how First Nations perspectives are redefining the Australian humanities for the future and long into the future. And they are important conversations that we need to have today, but it's a bigger conversation that we need to have collectively um, in Australia, but indeed across the world right now. UQ is really privileged to co-host the event with the Academy, who champion cultural, creative, ethical thinking to better understand our past and our present, as well as to shape and reimagine our future. For those who don't know, my proper name is Gregory Eggert. And, but as I'm known in this community of South East Queensland, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Chegg or Uncle Chegg, Look, I always start by saying I don't, I don't get to have the privilege of standing here to be and to do a welcome as, as such an event that we have in the next two days. Because it's a really important event because of what's happening in this environment, in our space in Australia. I don't stand here without the hard road that the ancestors have gone before me. Not just our ancestors that from this area here, but the ancestors of all of our different mobs throughout this country. Over 200 language and traditional land groups. We don't get to be at these places. We don't get to talk in universities. We don't get to become professors. We don't get to become elders and residents of ARC centres of excellence, which I am at now for Indigenous Futures, the new one. We don't do that without the hard road. And I'm not just talking about those two generations that have gone before me. I am talking about all the wars that we had in this country in the 1800s and the 1700s that people don't want to talk about, right? that history that they don't want to talk about, but I talk about it all the time. The frontier wars, we had one right here, right? My ancestor was born right over there in the spring in botanical gardens, right? I also want to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in this room as well. And First Nations people from all around this world who are here as well. Because enough is not said about our ancestors and what their perseverance, their resilience and their knowledge. And it's what they've experienced since colonisation in this country. So, you know, these lands that we're on today, that this hotel is on today, is of course the lands of the Yagra and the Turrbal people. As I said before, simply put, I'm just a black fella from South East Queensland whose mobs are Yagara, Gurumpu, and Kabi Kabi. These lands have always been a place where our mobs 
shared knowledge and learnt. And we want to pass that knowledge on to the next generations of our mob. Is this environment in the next 20 or 30 years let us going to do that? I don't know. I do not know. So with that said, I'll just say a few words to welcome you to this place. This is Aboriginal land, not in the past, but now this land we call Australia. The home of the oldest continuous race on this planet. How good is that? The spirits have shaped the land and where the spirits dwell are sacred places and we are its people. Aboriginal people have lived on this country in southeast Queensland for thousands, 65,000 years. When I graduated from Teachers College many, many moons ago, they talk, used to talk about 10,000 years. Now it's gone up to 65,000 years. Sooner or later, they'll get it right that we've been here forever. So here into the west, we have the Yagra, the Yagra Pool and the Doorbell people and more. And to the east, we have the Gurumpal, the Nunakal, the Nugi people and more. And south, we have the Mulanjali, the Gitable, the Bunjalung, the Yugambe people and more. And to the north, we have the Kabikabi, the Bachala, the Waka Waka people and more. We are the descendants and, and we are to be recognised. Yes, this is Aboriginal land, a spiritual land, land that we have never ceded our sovereignty. And we are its people. Yes, I am a storyteller, so when it comes to language, I don't know too much, but I know enough. So, which is Bolka, be Bolka, which means welcome, welcome, to this place in Yagra language. And thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, we've had Uncle Chegg's welcome and acknowledgement, but I too would like to acknowledge the First Nations and Indigenous people present and pay my respects to elders and custodians past, present, and emerging. Thank you, Bronwyn, for your intelligent and determined work at the University of Queensland and beyond. And thank you for your support for this partnership with the Academy, the Australian Academy of Humanities, to host what is being billed as our agenda setting symposium. Thank you, Uncle Chegg Eggert. I appreciate very much hearing more about the lands which I have come to call my home. And to hear, and in hearing your words of acknowledgement of country and welcome, it is an honor to be part of a group having the courageous conversations we need to have today on your country. As you know, I'm standing in today for Emeritus Professor Leslie Head, who for personal reasons can't be with us today, and is very disappointed to miss this event. She completes her three-year term as president of the Academy of Humanities later this year, and it has been particularly important to her that the Academy has at last begun a phase of listening and including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars in this decision-making. For Leslie and for me, this is an essential part of what these two days ahead represent. I truly hope this is an agenda-setting symposium for Indigenous studies in our universities and research sector, for the Academy and its soon-to-be 12 disciplinary sections, and for the context in which all of us here work and contribute. Indigenous knowledges, research methodologies, and pedagogies are transforming Australian research and learning, as well as Australian culture. 
And if I can take one example from my own discipline, theater and drama, of how this is happening, the last few years have demonstrated an enormous shift in theater making, writing, producing, and performing in Australia. To give you just one illustration, I'd like to bring your attention to the name of the most popular playwright in Australia. For literally decades and decades, that crown has been worn by one playwright only, and that's William Shakespeare. When I first came to Australia in 1990, I was shocked that this was the case even then. Shakespeare's record has remained until 2019. In that year, the most popular playwright in Australia was Nakia Louie, a very talented Camilla Roy and Torres Strait Islander woman. The changes may be slow, but they are happening, to echo Bronwyn's comments as well. And I support the aim of the Indigenous organizers of this symposium to speed this change. I acknowledge and welcome our national and international guests and keynote speakers today, Professors Robert Warrior and Susan Hill, Martin Nakata in absentia, um, Brendan Hokofitu, Gillian Cowlishaw, and Tim Rouse. And I welcome all presenters, discussants, and participants. This is a pressing challenge we have before us. We have in office an uh, Australian Minister for Education who has begun to demonstrate with promise the high value his government will place on Indigenous-led research and Indigenous participation in higher education. But the task of strengthening and embedding Indigenous studies in our university and research systems remains formidable. The Australian Academy of Humanities is one of Australia's five learned academies, independent organizations established to encourage excellence in their respective fields and to provide expertise and advice at public, institutional, and government levels. Our academy supports a fellowship of senior scholars elected through 11 and soon to be 12 disciplines. The number of indigenous fellows in the academy is small, but it is growing with solid commitment. Established just 54 years ago, the Academy of Humanities emerged from the Australian Humanities Research Council and has been in part uh, a means of tempering the expansion of scientific and technological education. An influential early report on Australia's university system, authored by the chairman of the British University Grants Commission, Sir Keith Murray, speaking not unselfconsciously to a universalized but narrow class of British Australian society, stated, we can handle machines and physical nature beyond the dreams of previous generations, but we handle ourselves, our families, and our fellow human beings in general no better and perhaps less well than our fathers did before us. Our handling of machines and physical nature today is far from the dream Murray so confidently described, and it is a national tragedy that the ways in which non-Indigenous Australia so typically handles itself in regard to Indigenous families and fellow human beings when that requires such urgent improvement. The Australian humanities are poorer for having taken so long to listen to Indigenous voices and so long to seek a genuine engagement with the experiences of Indigenous people. In November this year, the Academy will, <clears throat> excuse me, will welcome a new disciplinary section into being, the first in 25 years. This Indigenous Studies section has grown from engagement with Indigenous Fellows, and I would like to call out Aileen Morton Robinson, Bronwyn Carlson, Shino Kanishi, and Kim Scott, among others. Thank you. And thanks also to Sean Ulm and Stuart Cunningham, who's here, for your contributions here as well. This is the Academy's only Indigenous-conceived and Indigenous-led disciplinary section, and I look forward to seeing its impact in all of the activities of the Academy and on the Australian humanities as a whole. Today will be the agenda setting then, we hope, in two ways. First, to describe the immediate urgency that exists and provide a call to action 
to elevate and embed Indigenous studies in Australia's universities and research sector. And second, through its examination of Indigenous studies contributions to the decolonization of humanities disciplines and a recasting of the Australian humanities in a manner that will empower it to contribute to addressing the increasingly urgent challenges our human and non-human communities face. I'm looking forward to these two days of courageous listening and discussion. Afterwards, we anticipate bringing the work of the symposium forward to the fellows of the academy and to the sector. And thank you in advance for your contributions. Thanks. Tēnā koutou katoa. Tuatahi ke te mihi ki te tangata whenua o tēnei rohe, nga te Turbul, nga te Jagera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tuarua ke te mihi e te rangatira Uncle Chegg, mō te awhi o tēnei hui. So as I've just said, I'd like to pay my respects to the peoples of the unceded lands where we meet today, the Turbul and Jagera peoples. Um, secondly, to Uncle Chegg, thank you for welcoming us to this country and giving us the protection that we, that we need today to have these uh, courageous conversations. Um, thirdly, to the, uh, the organisers of today, the Academy and um, Bronwyn's office, the DVCI office at the University of Queensland, thank you very much for initiating these, um, these conversations that are really important, not just to Australia but worldwide. Uh, Ko Waio, as um, Bronwyn said, I'm Ngāti Pukinga. My name is Brendan Hokofatu. I'm the director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Indigenous Futures and a professor of Indigenous Research in the Faculty of Business, Economics and Law at the University of Queensland. So I'll spend a little bit of time introducing myself for... Um, well, I'll get to the reason later, but so... This is the map of where I'm from. Um, I'm not sure if this is a pointer, but... Anyway, the Matatua. Kiwi. This area here. This is where I'm from. Uh, Matatua was... Matatua was a waka, a, a canoe, um, ocean-going ve vessel that travelled from... Uh, Makoe, in the, um, an island in the Pacific, and um, it was captained by my eponymous ancestor Tōroa. Um, there was also, also famous Māori on there, Muriwai, Wairaka. Um, they became prominent. The, the descendants of these people became the prominent iwi or tribes. Tūhoi, Ngātiawa, Whakatōhe, Te Whānau Apanui. All, of, all in that region that I showed you before, the Matatua region, um, and also Ngāti Pukinga, which I am. So this is Tōroa and his lineage, and um, as it says there, Pukinga was born and grew up in the Eastern Bay of Plenty um, at Ruatuki, a fifth-generation descendant of Tōroa and captain of the Matatua Waka. a little bit about one of my um, one of my cultural heritage sites, Mo Ao. So called Tauranga Te Moana, my sea is Tauranga, called Mo Ao Te Maunga, my, my mountain is Mo Ao. So Mo Ao got its name um, in kind of a love story. They fell in love with another uh, Maunga, another mountain. Um, but there was not a lot of reciprocity in that um, in that love and so my Maunga who actually didn't have their name at that stage, um, wanted to end their life. And so they asked Patu Pairehe, the supernatural beings, to haul them into the ocean so they could drown themselves. Um, but the Patu Pairehe, being night creatures, uh, they, f they, they left as morning, the morning sun rose and um, leaving my maunga at the edge between land and sea and what is now um, the Tauranga Harbour, um, if anyone's ever been to Tauranga. So my maunga now with the name Mo'ao, which means caught by the morning sun. <laughs> 
And so this, you can see that, that red area there in the, in the top map. This is where I come from. I grew up in Apotiki, which is in the southern end, end down there, but is actually Whakatoa here country. Um, so not my iwi, but same Matatua um, waka. Um, Whakatane is where the Matatua waka landed. Pukehina, which Bronwyn and Aileen have actually been to. We have a, a beach house there, a beach shack. Um, and Makatu, which is where my father was born and raised, is just north of that. Mo Isle sits in that little harbour there, which I just described, the, the, the Maunga, the mountain, and Tauranga, the sea there. So lastly, um, Ngāti Pukinga had a seed of, deed of settlement settled fairly recently, um, which gave us a, a few million dollars, not a lot, con considering just one block of land would have probably, in, in the Tauranga area, because it's such a popular place to live, would have probably been the, the, the complete total of our settlement. But nonetheless, um, we've put it to good use. So this is um, a group that we, a uh, hui group that we use recently held together. Um, so in that, if you see in this area, a lot of, a lot of the green land there is actually farming land. Um, so there's a lot of dairy runoff. Um, and so we've put our, some of our monies into, um, into restoring the land. There's a there's a wetlands project that we uh, that we're initiating to protect the the native life um, that lives in our in our estuary, but that all that farming land just runs right throughout there. So it's a it's a huge task in front of us. So I'm just going to talk today. Um, this is an overview about unnatural divisions. Um, courageous conversations, indigenous studies globally, and then I'll also focus on Māori studies. Um, but I'd, if you'd allow me to just start with a poem that I wrote a few years ago and have had added to since. It's called Dis-Ease. And from this tension, this dis-ease, this violence, an in invalid ontology springs. Its power holds rivers at bay, muffles ghosts, holds her, papatuanuku, earth mother hostage, a resource, its power binds. A new order strewn together on foreign forms, unnatural divisions between the physical and metaphysical, the everyday and the sublime, Fakari whispers erupts. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time introducing myself um, because I think it's become important for us as Indigenous scholars to, to reclaim these spaces and to um, make them subjective Indigenous spaces, but also trying to steer away from the kind of will to authenticate my indigeneity. I don't think we need to do that. Um, but more importantly, because it speaks back to the, the taxonomy of Western knowledge, how Western knowledge orders the academy, and has actually afforded a very minuscule space um, to Indigenous studies within that academy, right in the borderlands, right in the hinterlands, in the arts and humanities. So my introduction was short, but it speaks to an Indigenous world, an Indigenous ontology that encaptures all of the Western taxonomy and much, much more. Divisions of sciences, the science of navigation from my ancestors who navigated the largest ocean in the world, hundreds of voyages backwards and forth between backwards and forth between the east, north and south Pacific, and hundreds of years before Captain Cook rolled up in his prehistoric boat. The division of health sciences, the truth of my Maunga, Mo Ao's story, talks the importance of community health and well-being due to its esoteric nature, goes far beyond the Western medical model. The division of business and economics, the reference to Ngāti Pukinga's Treaty of Waitangi Deed of Settlement, and how my people are using it in part to restore the whenua, the land from colonial abuses, speaks to the indigenous economies invested in a different kind of relations of production.
and driven by an epistemology where there is no division between base and superstructure. Papa Tuanuku, Mother Earth, is both our base and superstructure. The division of arts and humanities. In my introduction, you would have heard history, genealogy, political studies, human ecologies. Let's be real that when we refer to the humanities, we refer to Western human and Western arts. Indigenous people are not a part of this humanity. Their humanness is allegorical. It only exists to paint a more vivid picture of Western humanity. Whether that be as the prehistoric South in anthropological and archaeological accounts, or to give a political advantage to states like the US and Australia in area studies. In total, the taxonomy of Western ways of dividing up the world cut across indigenous ways of knowing. So I guess my first contention or questioning is should indigenous knowledge, knowledge actually exist in the Western Academy at all? Let us not forget two things. Firstly, there's knowledge about indigenous peoples in the Western Archive, in museums, in cabinet displays, in books and journals. This rem knowledge remains like a ghost, a spectre in the Academy. This haunting we cannot simply ignore. When we talk about indigenous studies, because its presence signals multiple violences that precede the ongoing violences that indigenous scholars continue to face in the academy today. Secondly, there's the indigenous knowledge that we ourselves bring into the academy, which is of course inherently dangerous because the very nature of the Western Academy is to desire the universalization of knowledge. And so when we bring in indigenous knowledge into the academy, it, inevitab it inevitably gets coded within a Western project. The colonial project is not over. The will to universalize knowledge to present generalizable facts about humanity is not over. So we need to be real about this imperative to subsume knowledge, to synthesize indigenous knowledge into forms comprehensible to Western ways of knowing. So our task ahead is, is onerous. So I did want to spend some time on um, the, the context that I know best, which is Aotearoa, New Zealand, and particular Māori studies in Aotearoa. So I think I've got a unique perspective of being um, an Associate Dean at, at Otago University, which is in New Zealand, and then I moved to the University of Alberta, where I was the Dean of the Faculty of Native Studies there, and after a stint there, I moved back to Aotearoa, where I was the Dean of the Faculty of Māori Indigenous Studies at the University of Waikato. So I've got a unique perspective in that I've um, been embedded in, in multiple contexts, Indigenous spaces. Um, but our conversation last night with Aileen and others, um, I realised Indigenous study Indigenous studies in Australia is in an unenviable position of possibly being in the worst position compared to other unsettler states such as US, Canada and New Zealand. It lacks a genealogy, a standardised curriculum, a stable history um, that what that means in a neoliberal university system is that it's easily expendable and I just heard last night about events about the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of South Australia uh, just being completely deleted, I guess because um, the numbers didn't add up. And so that's the other thing we're up against is the numbers. Um, and so as a dean, I've, I was kind of always uh, pressured about that, especially in, in Canada where our faculty was really small compared to the, all the other faculties. Um, so we're always having to justify ourselves in our presence. And I think that's one thing the Academy needs to realise is to stop justifying Indigenous Studies presence um, based on numbers. However, um, I do think, and I, I'll get to this later, I do think the kind of what where we're at today in Australia is also a good thing. The, the lack of stability, the lack of um, anything concrete, anything really concrete is, is a positive. So, just a really brief history, um, 
And I want to acknowledge uh, Ranginui Walker, one of our preeminent Māori scholars who's passed away, unfortunately, but um, he provided a, a history of Māori studies, which I've drawn off today. Um, so it really does start with anthropological roots, um, beginning in 1892 with the formation of the Polynesian Society by um, two, Pākehā scholar, uh, two Pākehā scholars, Percy Smith and Edward Tregear, um, who interestingly brought in three Māori anthropologists, um, Te Rangi Hiro, uh, who is Peter Buck, um, Sir Apirana Nata, and uh, Maori Pōmare. Now that's interesting because um, they, they, the Maori anthropologists were really the, the beginnings of Maori studies, but they also performed an anthropology in the, in the Pacific Islands that replicated their, their white brotherhood and that they um, provided ethno ethnological uh, descriptions of our Pacific brothers and sisters. Um, so, Nata argued for Māori language to be offered as a subject for a BA degree, um, successful in making it a subject, but it never got up during his living time. He had to argue things like it's a foreign language because of the dominance of English. Um, they argued back that uh, you, Māori language doesn't have a literature, so over 20 years he compiled a corpus of knowledge that, that eventually formed the corpus that was to become Māori Studies. So the New Zealand Board of Studies did eventually approve Māori language to become a subject, but didn't actually provide a lectureship for it, so it never got off the ground during Nutter's years. Um, yes, and as that says there, in 1946, the Auckland Regional Council of Adult Education appoints tutor to teach Māori arts, crafts, language and folklore to urban migrants. And interestingly, as Māori began to urbanise um, and were losing their culture in great, in great droves, uh, it became more, uh, more possible to have it within the academy. So in 1951, Bruce Biggs is appointed in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Auckland. Um, and a quote there by Professor Ralph Piddington, who is the head of anthropology there, teaching the native tongue was essential to the discipline of anthropology. Um, and later on, there was an addition of a Māori cultural stream. And in 1991, Māori studies at Auckland becomes um, separated from anthropology and becomes its own department. Now I give a kind of a, a history of Auckland University, which was the precursor to all other Māori studies in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, but they all follow similar suit. So the Treaty of Waitangi becomes important in the 1980s um, as a, a touch point for Māori academics to say, we need Māori content within the curriculum of universities. And so the Bachelor of Arts Māori Studies becomes a thing, um, first started in, in the University of Auckland. And it has, it has two, um, two major streams. The first is Te Reo Māori, so you could do Level 1 Te Kākano, Level 2 Te Pihinga, uh, Level 3 Te Mahuri. So that would be your kind of structure of your degree, um, and then you would take uh, papers around that. And then there was the Tikanga Māori stream, uh, Fai Kōrero, which is the, the art of oration, um, learning about Marae protoc protocols, Raranga, which is weaving, and Fakairo, which is carving. So this kind of cultural preservation idea and the preservation of language was, you know, obviously came out of anthropology departments, so there was the idea to preserve um, indigenous cultures. And then also Māori taking up the banner because they wanted to preserve their culture as well. They wanted language to be strong. And um, their hard work is definitely evident today. Um, but then later on, things in the tikanga Māori stream and the Māori cultural stream, um, like political studies, media studies, and law and education began to evolve out of 
that stream. I'm pressing my computer and it's not working. Um, so here are the six major universities currently in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I just want to give you an overview of where we're at. Um, so the University of Auckland has a School of Māori and Pacific Studies and they're within the Faculty of Arts. They also have Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, which is the Centre of Research Excellence for Māori. AUT, Auckland University of Technology, has Te, te Ara Pautama, the Faculty of Māori Indigenous Development, and I think that's key to one of my points, the faculty. University of Waikato, Te Pua Wānaka, also has a faculty, which I was the Dean of. Um, Victoria University, Te Kaua Maui School of Māori Studies is located in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. University of Canterbury, very similar, has a School of Māori and Indigenous Studies. Aotahi, um, also uh, located in the Faculty of, Faculty of Arts. Um, the University of Otago, Tatumu, which, which is where I started, has a School of Māori and Indigenous Studies located in the Division of Humanities. So, I guess the, one of the points I want to make in terms of um, how we need to think about in critical Indigenous studies is where is it lying in the university hierarchical structure? So when I was Associate Dean in Otago, we were a school which was located in the Division of Humanities and I've, I'll be honest, I didn't see a lot of Indigenous sovereignty in that space because we didn't really own our budget. We were always kind of having to speak upwards about travelling to wherever we wanted to travel to, um, or, you know, as an example. Um, and then I went to the Faculty of uh, Native Studies at the University of Alberta, which was a very small faculty, but nonetheless, um, there, was, there was, I think there was 18 other faculties. So I was on the Dean's Council, so I sat around the room where, where a lot of power was, and I think that's important. And we owned our own budget line as well. Uh, the Faculty of Māori and Indigenous Studies at the University of Waikato was similar. We had our own budget line. We got to make um, some of our own choices in terms of budget and hires and whatnot, so we weren't always having to speak upwards. Although it wasn't obviously completely sovereign, nonetheless there was some sovereignty there. Okay, so I do want to get back to the point about where Australia's at. <clears throat> so I do very much see the kind of genealogy in Aotearoa as being a white saviour genealogy for Māori studies. It came out of anthropology and the focus was on preservation. It also led to a form of ethnic formalism where um, there was certain ways of being authentically Māori uh, in relation to Māori culture and, and language which I think was very important at a time um, because we had to hold on to these ethnic, these identities and these ways of being just because um, things were so difficult. But I th do think that Māori studies has become stagnant. So in New Zealand we've, we've had koanga reo, um, kura kaupapa, so the Māori language basically throughout um, Indigenous schools at the pre, uh, preschool level, at the primary school level and at the secondary school level and now we have uh, Māori universities. And so this idea of preserving culture doesn't really hold up anymore, especially where we have these university, um, Māori universities that are kind of actively teaching language in a much different way um, than in the university system. And so I guess I'm saying the kind of our genealogy and our, the stagnancy that's happened and we're still teaching the same things um, since Bruce Biggs taught them back in the 1950s demonstrates that the possibility for Australia right now to, to take, um, that, 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 there's, that the time is right for change and you don't have a lot of things holding you back and that's, a, that's an advantage I think. And I guess that gets me to um, Canada, 
and the US. I think Robert would um, have a lot more information than I, but I think both the Canada and the US had, um, so the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta was very, very unique. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but I do think it's the only faculty uh, in, um, in North America. So very unique to have that kind of sovereign space. Um, typically there's, a, there's growing departments, so UBC, the First Nations and Indigenous Studies, which is located in the Faculty of Arts as an example um, of a very good department, but nonetheless it's within um, the Faculty of Arts. And then there's other, what I kind of came to understand, programs where you might have a, a person in political studies, history, geography, and they all teach into a program. Um, and that might sound and loose and, um, and not the best way to do things, but it does bring in different kind of ideas into the, um, into the equation. And so I do want to talk about NASA um, soon. Yes. Um, so this kind of idea that that there's multiple discourses influencing the space, and NASA arrives, um, created by many wonderful scholars, including um, Professor Robert Warrior, and then distinguished Professor Aileen Morton Robinson is here as well. She was absolutely key to the studying. Um, but it comes at a time where I believe Globally, Indigenous Studies was really searching for something. I'm not sure if it was luck or fate, but all these different discourses that were coming out of philosophy, cultural studies, media studies, um, enters into the space and creates a whole different kind of thing that's going on in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where it's, it's, it's about preserving culture. Um, and then you, you start to see the, the nurturing of um, the nurturing of a critical Indigenous Studies space. So I think, Robert, you're going to probably <laughs> shake your head at me, but prior to 2006, um, driven by US-based scholars, Robert Warrior, Jeannie O'Brien, Shanina, Shanina Lomawaima, Jace Weaver, and Kehalani Kawanui, these scholars attended regular meetings at American Studies Association um, annual conference, but found that indigenous knowledge was exactly what I've previously outlined. It was largely um, invisible, invisibilized and, and not afforded what it should be afforded. So these indigenous scholars had the inkling of creating their own association, their own space, their own territory, their own voice for native uh, American scholars, led by indigenous scholars and that did not need to conform to non-indigenous frameworks. Three years later, NASA officially became an association, and I think we have four presidents or president-elects in the room, myself, Robert, Aileen, and Sue. Um, so we are very blessed with the people that are sitting in the room today. Um, the initial gathering in o Oklahoma was not large, uh, probably 80 people. 300, okay. It was large, um, but significantly a number of scholars were not US-based, including a number of international scholars, a number from Canada, such as Chris Anderson, and a number from Hawaii. There was also a number of um, Australian mob, distinguished Professor Aileen Mont Robinson, Professor Tracy Bunder, and Phil Hawk, Fork, and Professor Martin Nakata. And from my mob, there were three of us. There was Alice Tapunga Somerville, who's now at UBC, there was Roger Marker, um, who retired about 10 years ago, but was actually uh, the head of school at Saskatchewan, um, and myself. So the central point here is that the 20 or so international scholars that were there um, made up a forceful presence and it forced the leadership of, you know, the, the burgeoning leadership of NASA to think about the possibilities of the association not being Native American Studies Association, but the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. And so the following year in Georgia, which I attended, uh, was, was bigger, um, had a large contingent of vocal Hawaiians. Um, there were some controversial 
public and private meetings that were necessary. Eventually, the membership agreed that the association be, na be named the Native American Indigenous Studies Association. Um, and significantly, Roger Marker and Aileen uh, made notable stands to internationalize the association. So the association is now the most significant gathering of indig international indigenous scholars from around the world. Um, Robert was just reflecting that when, when the group of them began formulating the idea of NACE or NASA, um, he, was, he didn't imagine that in 2019, 13 years later, that there would be a gathering under NASA in Aotearoa of 2,000 scholars, um, indigenous scholars. So, yes, I'd just like to pay my respects to all the leadership that's gone in, in NASA. Um, because it really has created uh, a space for indigenous intellectualizing that is really key to, was key to my development and key to so many other people's development, and just a space that, uh, that indigenous peoples can come together. So I guess I'm, I'm thinking in relation to Australia that you may feel there's not a lot of genealogy there, but you have a time that is ripe where you can make a change. But it's going to need labour from the young and indigenous scholars in the room, from young indigenous scholars around the country to do the work um, to make those dreams possible. Five minutes. OK. Um, I'll just briefly talk about this. So I think what we're talking about in terms of we, where Indigenous Studies is located in the academy, we need to be clear, I, what I said before, that um, the academy wants to own knowledge itself. They think they have the rights, the Western Academy. So this is a fairly recent example. So in the New Zealand secondary school curriculum, they're going to create a, a Māori history and a Māori science curriculum to go and to teach the secondary school students. Um, and a group of seven University of Auckland scholars protested that there was no such thing as university uh, as, as Māori science. Um, you can read the quotes there. Although, although Indigenous knowledge may play some role in the preservation of local practices and in management and policy, it falls far short of what, we can, be, what can be defined as science itself. Matauranga Māori should not be accepted as an equivalent to science, adding it may help, but it is not science. So, so the Western Academy does not just try to claim European knowledge, it tries to claim the rights to knowledge itself. The premise of the Western Academy produces places that are inherently structurally racist because other forms of knowledge are marginalised. This does not mean, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll move on. Um, Again, this is structurally racist because of the centrality of objectivity to the Western academic tradition. Not only is this a false notion in that it comes from a specific worldview, it also serves to foreclose other knowledges and the value afforded to other knowledge taxonomies. And so we must resist these fundament fundamental Western academic concepts and see them for what they are entirely subjective. So I wanted to um, quote distinguished Professor Aileen Morton Robinson here. Um, the origins of indigenous sovereignties are in and of the earth. We draw on and exert the life force we share with and derive from our creators, ancestors and relatives that inextricably unite us with the earth and to, res to our respective shared territories. We have origin stories that emanate from and connect us as humans and non-humans. I use the term non-human to refer to all things that do not have human form. Our ontologies, our ways of being indigenous are inextric inextricably connected to being in and of our lands. This is an inherent sovereignty. I want to connect Aileen's powerful words of hope and indigenous sovereignty to us, for us all today. Um, but also to the words of uh, Michel Foucault, 
Genealogy is a way of playing local, discontinuous, disqualified or non-legitimized knowledges of, off against the unitary theoretical instance that claims to be able to filter them, organize them into a hierarchy, organize them into the name of a true body of knowledge in the name of the rights of a science that is in the hands of a few. I think those two quotes are really powerful together. Um, so, to conclude, the co courageous conversations we need to have are about Indigenous knowledge spaces in the Western Academy. So some closing points. In Australia, Aileen's uh, recent labour has unearthed that largely the domain, that indigenous research in the academy largely remains the domain of white historians, archeologists, geographers, political scientists, and of course, anthropologists. ARC grants, for example, they allocate to indigenous research over the last 10 years demonstrates this because the overwhelming amount of money has gone to non-indigenous led research. The replacement of indigenous knowledge almost exclusively in the humanities meant that indigenous science, for example, is non-existent. And this is what I mean by cutting across indigenous epistemologies. So not indigenous led and actually the structure of university taxonomy was racist. Just to qualify what I mean by racist here, it's not just a throwaway word. The university is underpinned, as I've said before, by universal knowledge that it claims to be able to tell universal truths, truths that refer not just, to, not just to the world, but to the whole universe itself. We all know the concept of universal truths as a subjective positioning and a will to power. So I guess my, um, my reflection today is that the future of Indigenous studies is dependent on the fight that so many people in this room have been doing for years Aileen, Robert, Sue, Bronwyn, and others, and many others. Um, but also to seize the moment. So the, again, the idea that there hasn't been a great standardised curricula in, in the Australian scene means there is potential, just as there was potential in the US and Canada, Canada scene with the formation of NASA. Um, but as I've also said, there needs indigenous, the younger indigenous leadership to step up and to, to have those dreams and to, and to mobilise intellectual spaces for indigenous peoples to form our own sovereign indigenous spaces. Um, thank you all. Uh, I appreciate um, you listening to me this morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to know that there uh, is an Indigenous owner so that I, when I acknowledge Indigenous owners, there's at least one here, I hope more. Um, I always feel that those acknowledgements are a little uh, formal in that they acknowledge ownership, but that ownership is unlikely to uh, take its full... Um, power over the area, and I don't know whether Indigenous people would want this particular area of the city anymore um, <clears throat> in its present state. Uh, I congratulate the organisers of this symposium. I'm a great fan of courageous conversations, uh, and they are certainly needed at this time when everyone's speaking about the voice. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the voice. And thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm a bit out of touch because I've been retired for a while, but uh, nonetheless, um, I'm eager to learn from being here for the next couple of days. My speaking position, I don't know if that is current jargon these days, but I thought I'd announce it. Um, I am, of course, a white fella, a Ballander. Mooninga or Gubba in New South Wales, and thus a beneficiary of colonial history, though in Aotearoa. In fact, I was a neighbour of yours, um, Brendan, uh, from Vokatani, or actually Otakiri, 
one of the great advantages of the Maori in New Zealand, of course, is that there's one language and a sort of unity that doesn't exist in this country, and I'm going to be talking a little about that. Um, what else? Yes, I've worked in three remote communities, three communities, as uh, uh, was already said. Finally, I've, uh, I've also, I also studied anthropology at Sydney University, and I've taught courses called Aboriginal Studies for years, since the 1980s, since those courses began. <coughs> Thus, I think I can provide some understanding of the origin of scholarly work related to the indigenous owners of this continent and the early disputes and dramas from political activism, uh, from political activism to scholarly rivalries, which were very significant and still are, I imagine, in universities everywhere. And the personal, I'm going to talk in personal terms because I think the personal d dramas in, in negotiating these things are crucially important. And the position people come from themselves is, um, is very varied. And I really like the point about uh, science. What is science? And the notion that science is the measure of all knowledge. Um, so if Maori knowledge or indigenous knowledge is not scientific, then it's not taken seriously um, if it doesn't fit. I want to begin with a story. In the early 1970s, there was a d dispute about indigenous studies, and I use the term indigenous studies as it's used here. It was not then uh, used in the 70s. Um, there was a punch-up between a young black activist and a white anthropologist on the campus of Sydney University. Gary Foley was one of a group of creative, pioneering activists in Redfern. I hope you've all heard of him and his mates, uh, Paul Coe, etc. Um, they set up the Black Theatre, uh, wrote revolutionary pamphlets, demanded land rights and organised the Tent Embassy in Canberra. They were routinely um, arrested from outside, I think it was the Empress Hotel. Foley had begun to give informal lectures on Aboriginal history uh, in, Red, in a hall in Redfern. He scheduled his lectures at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, which was the same time that Dr. Les Hyatt was giving his lectures in the anthropology department at the university on traditional Aboriginal culture. The two men differed sharply about what Indigenous studies should be. Hyatt believed it was crucially important to convey to students the genius of Aboriginal traditional societies, which he knew about from his own work in a remote community among the Gijingali in Arnhem Land. For Foley, the knowledge of Australia's racist history was far more urgent and had been ignored by scholars. Foley wanted to expose the cruel history of New South Wales colonialism that his own family had experienced. Understanding a remote community's traditions must have seemed an irrelevant indulgence <coughs> to these New South Wales activists. The dispute could be seen as productive, not as a test of boxing expertise, although they both boasted of their boxing expertise. The two men at least glimpsed each other's purposes and agreed to coexist. I don't think they had much choice because we must note that Hyatt's work, of course, was supported by the uh, uh, university and the structure of the university um, legitimised it in a way that uh, Foley uh, couldn't, couldn't reach. He had no institutional support and it didn't last long and it was another decade before the colleges and universities started introducing Aboriginal studies. Uh, Foley's challenge raised questions about you know who should teach, what they should teach, the necessary qualifications to teach and the historical framework. Uh, it, it, I think the battle, the fight between those two men illustrates the historical framework and institutional contexts that have to be also taken into account when you're deciding 
how to teach and what to teach. It was the 1970s when I began studying at the university as a mature age student already. Uh, and I want to remind you of the dramatic changes in conditions since then. There was a huge, at that time, there was a huge body of extraordinarily oppressive state laws and they were being rescinded. Uh, John McCorkadale, if you're interested, I think that, I think the, um, that uh, list of, of references I put up, how do you make them? Oh, they're there, okay. So the, the people I'm going to mention are there. I, I didn't really do a thing for this door. Um, so they, those laws were being rescinded gradually and were coming into public debate, were coming into uh, uh, as, as shocking. I mean, there was a, a great um, horror, I think, of the sort of realisation across the country that these, the conditions under which Aborigines had existed. The accepted racial terminology was being sanitised. And I wonder if anybody has done a study of that, the, the history of the way uh, academics in particular dropped certain terms and were embarrassed about how to speak of certain things. Um, a conventional language of concern and sympathy for First Nations has now been standardised and symbolic recognition has become conventional and it's, that's a thing I'm always a little uncomfortable about. Many Aboriginal voices are heard and seen and celebrated in the public domain now, which, as we've heard already, doesn't necessarily mean what it appears to mean. Scholarship in this field has seen radical changes. Uh, despite all this, the overall relationship between Indigenous and settler Australians remains one of entrenched structural inequality, which is often deplored, but seldom, I believe, understood. Its roots, I think, are seldom understood. So I'm going to talk about anthropology and defend it. Um, in 1970, anthropology was the only discipline with a serious and lasting interest in Aboriginal people. Its ambitions have often been understood, and really we need to go back to uh, European history of the social sciences, which only came into being uh, a few centuries back, but in time. So all these things are, are time, all our knowledge and our science and our understandings are time constrained. They're of the present. Our knowledge is of the present. Doesn't necessarily equate with knowledge of the past. So in Europe, there was a consciousness and curiosity developed about deep human history, human social development long before there was sociology, history, archaeology, anthropology, there were separate, there, there, was a, uh, there was a curiosity and debate across all these things, including psychoanalysis, um, uh, political studies, of course, about the stages of human development from what was called primitive to civilised societies. Thomas Hobbes is frequently quoted, quoted in the 16th century for asserting that it appeared human lives had been nasty, brutish and short, engaged in a war of all of, against all before governments developed. And that was clearly something that um, political science has come into being to study politics, but that kind of politics had... Uh, were seen as having, uh, well, that kind of politics hadn't existed. What we call politics hadn't uh, existed. The discipline of anthropology could be seen as proving Hobbes wrong by showing that small-scale hunter-gatherer societies with simple technology and apparently no government lived mostly in peace with few needs and ample leisure. So in the early 20th century, Australians, as Indigenous people were then known, became world famous among European scholars who were establishing the new discipline of anthropology. Anthropologists were finding and documenting the intricacy, the sophistication and the variation 
of Australia's kinship systems, marriage rules, ceremonial life, religion, gender roles and cosmology. They were asking questions such as, are patrilineal clans typical? Had these marriage rules, had these marriage rules in Arnhem Land uh, developed before those ones in Central Australia? So they were looking at how the history was being, had been played out among the people they knew, knew as primitive. And I don't think primitive had a, such a negative um, connotation as it gained over colonial history. Um, with no, and one of the main questions was, of course, how was authority uh, garnered in, in uh, such small-scale societies that appeared to have no chiefs, or had no chiefs? In pursuit of the answers, individual anthropologists conducted immersive fieldwork. Often they were younger men relating to the elders as students, learning the practices and priorities of these very different societies. For instance, one young student from Harvard, Lloyd Warner, immersed himself in the social life of the people we now call Yongu in Arnhem Land. For years at a time, he went for several visits, I think three times, from the United States. And this was 1926 when the national press reported murderous black savages in Arnhem Land. So the, the uh, Warner was pretty brave, I think, and but but also got it became immersed in the Mungin life. And when he left, there's a postscript in the first edition of his book describing in very moving terms that he and his main friend there, Marcarola, wept, both, wept, both men wept as the boat left to go back to America. They knew that, he'd, he knew he'd never be back. Um, and this illustrates something of what I'd like to emphasise about what anthropologists do, and that is become immersed as students in, in the lives of very different societies. Not necessarily, of course. Ethnographies can take place anywhere, and I've been very interested in some from uh, studying the wealthy, the very wealthy in the USA, or one, actually. And there aren't many of that kind because it's often hard to get embedded in... Uh, that's called studying up. It's hard to get embedded among people who's whose uh, place in the world is very superior to one's own. Um, and that's their, uh, the power they wield, of course. Um, OK. Uh, anthropologists work thus contested the popular notions of wild savages and of a backward inferior race, not only in their scholarly work, but in living in remote communities, particularly in the Northern Territory and probably Central Australia, uh, where um, they were reviled for flouting the established practices, particularly the landowners in these places were, were uh, had, there was a whole language of disgust and dispute and hostility towards, towards the, uh, the anthropologists. But at the same time, as the 70s progressed, and I'm, I'm locating most of this in the 70s and my realisation of these things. They were, um, uh, they were gaining uh, hostility from, people in the, from Aboriginal people in the South, like Gary Foley already mentioned. Um, they saw anthropologists as illegitimate author authorities in their cultural domain. Uh, but anthropologists did not consider people like Foley as true Aborigines. They had, it was said, lost their culture. That term was a very common, in very common usage about Aborigines from the South. Their plight was not the business of scholars such as says Hyatt, because he was a scientist, as uh, already mentioned. The category of science was, was uh, very powerfully used to um, depict what knowledge was was uh, to be taken seriously. 
Conceptually, the discipline at that time, in the 70s, excluded any interest in colonial history, and critical colonial history had not yet arrived. I use the term classical anthropologist to refer to that kind of anthropology. And I know Les Hyatt, for instance, he was my supervisor, and I have great respect for him, but um, for him, uh, science was the measure. Science meant systematic, careful, detailed study and was not a matter of any political, had no, had no political implications and that's um, the thing that I rather uh, fell out with him about. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not as fluent as I used to be. <laughs> Donald Thompson, oh yes, there were, there were arguments about, but it's not that anthropologists entirely ignored the plight of their subjects. They, um, for instance, there were arguments about, among the class, classical anthropologists, among the direction of government policy, and Donald Thompson, but this is back in the 30s and 40s, wanted governments to expand the reserves to protect Aboriginal people or to rather to protect Aboriginal culture from settlers' aggression. And they were accused of wanting to keep Aborigines in zoos. The other alternative policy direction that was the core, these were core arguments, was to, uh, 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 um, to provide schooling and inclusion in other mainstream institutions. But they were attacked as assimilationists. So there were two possible futures imagined. Either these traditional people became educated, uh, were the recipients of health uh, and uh, um, health and educational institutions, and so on, and language. Uh, they were to speak English. I noticed recently one of the one of our politicians said, "If Aborigines want to be." I don't remember exactly. He said they had to learn English if they wanted to advance. And the notion of advance was, was quite taken for granted at those times. Advance into becoming assimilated was the implication. I started at uni I said that already. I started at university. I was thrilled when I went to university to discover studies of all sorts of cultures. Think, uh, there were... Um, studies, uh, I did a course on caste systems in India, Islam in Indonesia, village life in Papua New Guinea, the Eskimo of Canada, and anthropology was flourishing at that time. Um, only two lecturers in a, in a department of about 20, two lecturers taught in the field of indigenous studies, and they had both done field work in the 60s, so you know, even earlier. Dr. Les Hyatt, who already mentioned, had lived in Arnhem Land for two years with the Ginjangali as his elders. Like other cl classicists, Hyatt dreaded, felt there was a certain dread about the future, but that wasn't talked about. The details of his course were about the nature, the belief system, the um, uh, philosophy, the, the uh, structure, uh, particularly, he, he said at one point, there are people without, without government, uh, people without politics, that's right. But of course there was a politics which he detailed, which was the way negotiations occurred as a matter of everyday life. And that's what I discovered in my field work, the, the way people didn't order each other around ever. Um, there was a very deep sense that everybody was autonomous, I'm boss for myself, uh, and that um, if, if a, a communal activity was to take place, it had to be negotiated. It was a matter of negotiation with others. So the, uh, the entrance of white um, government agents to the community was always a great puzzle. Who's this bloke? What's he want? You know, it's, it's kind of, and, and how come he's saying these things that takes no notice of us, you know, of our wishes? So it, 
there's a really deep matter there, I think, of, of politics and of internalised culture that is, is a, a, a source of constant um, dispute, I suppose, unstated dispute um, between government agents and remote people of that, of that history, of that kind. Um, so, so although the and, uh, yes, there's another point. The other, the other anthropologist teaching uh, indigenous studies at that time was Jeremy Beckett, whose work was with what was known then as half caste people in Western New South Wales. He lived on a small. He lived on a small mission with them, and went contract fencing with them, and obeyed the suspicious manager, as they did. Beckett's 1958 MA thesis detailed their poverty and confinement and their strategies to counter humiliation from the, from the manager and from the police. While not explicitly challenging classical anthropology, Beckett's teaching was mildly subversive, especially as he played the satirical songs of Wipkanya folk singers Dougie Young during his lectures. Have any of you heard of Dougie Young? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, this was in the 1960s. He'd recorded many of his folk songs, and they're available. I think the uh, ta the um, what do you call it? the recording is called um, "The Land Where the Clo Crow Flies Backwards." But it, one of his songs was "I'm Tall, Dark, and Lean. Every place I've been, the white man calls me Jack." And uh, there were other songs where he made fun of white hypocrisy, and he called himself. Youngie Doug, because the police put his surname first. Um, he, I, I thought these were brilliant uh, songs, and although the notion at the time when I was sitting in the lecture hall didn't really strike me of how significant that he was an organic intellectual after Gramsci. Neither the public nor the discipline was it ready to accept such an analysis, and of course he wasn't. He wasn't a scientist. When I graduated in 1974, I decided to continue to a PhD, and I was the only student of my year to work in Australia, so that the the discipline was already becoming. Um, uh, what can I say? Uh, uncomfortable, uh, perhaps, with um, from people like uh, who, uh, people who were challenging these radical blackfellas in Redfern, challenging the uh, very basis of anthropology. They'd made a lot of uh, made for a lot of scholarly nervousness. Let's say my friends worked in Sumatra, New Guinea, and India and Ireland actually. The teaching of classical anthropology, of course, didn't make much impact on popular convictions about indigenous people. The powers unleashed by colonial history were far more influential than an intellectual endeavor of a small social science discipline. There were also contradictions within anthropology's theory and practice, but I haven't got time to talk about that. Breckett's approach may appear Wow, five minutes, I'm only on page six. <laughs> Beckett's approach may appear more radical and politically progressive than Hyatt's, but let me emphasize the more radical nature of Hyatt's basic conceptual convictions. Racial inequality was officially assumed and legally enforced at that time. But in anthropology, the term otherness or radical alterity does not refer to different human beings, but to the radically different ways equivalent human beings construct, reproduce, and grapple with their social worlds. All societies are equally and legitimately human, and different cultures are evidence of human adaptability, inventiveness, intelligence, and creativity. The radical lesson of the classicals, uh, classicists' research was that no one particular social arrangement, whether language, belief, kinship system, economic system, etc., are better or worse than any other. Ethnographers expand the conception of human ways of being in the world by offering comparisons between European self-acclaimed civilization and a host of equally 
valuable human social arrangements. Okay, public interest in Aborigines was still neg neg negligible in the 1970s and largely patronising and pitying, although it was growing fast. Aboriginal people were mentioned in the Sydney Morning Herald only in terms of scandals, either scandals about their appalling living conditions or the antisocial behaviour. One evoked sympathy, the other evo evoked anger. But, the, but Aborigines were mostly absent from the th thoughts of urban Australians. Was it Indigenous activists or historians who led the changes in, in, in that situation? It was, of, it, it was, of course, the Aborigines of Southern Australia, then denigrated as half-castes or mixed race that became influential in the 1970s. I meant to mention that Stanner, the famous Stanner, visited Beckett in his fieldwork site in Wilcannia. And um, according Beckett uh, said that Stanner couldn't understand why he was working with these people. They were of no interest, he thought. Um, and Stanner was on his way to his remote field site in the north. Um, and that, that would have been a very common, common view among scholars of all kinds. Uh, but it was the people of Southern Australia that became influential in the 1970s with their revolutionary arguments and slogans, white Australia has a black history, etc. Um, Kevin Gilbert pub published a powerful book arguing that the Aboriginal people themselves had to make changes. The title was Because a White Man Will Never Do It. And Marcia Langton was embraced by the ANU Anthropology Department until she published an essay entitled Urbanising Aborigines, The Social Scientist's Great Deception in 1982 and switched to the History Department. And there was another student at ANU in the 1980s who uh, switched from anthropology to sociology. She's sitting over there. <laughs> the, that was, she moved from my course <laughs> to sociology wisely, I think. There were, I, don't think I don't think anthropology had much to, uh, uh, to offer Aileen. The tent embassy was a brilliant embarrassment to governments. Activists spearheaded the setting up of the legal service in Sydney, etc., etc. So uh, you probably know about all that, that activism at that time. The first major academic breakthrough was from Charles Rowley, who, who I thought I'd put his, uh, a quote from him there. Uh, he, he, wrote, he wrote, well, he and a team of um, uh, uh, he had a, t a team of um, scholars behind him and, and they wrote these three books, The Destruction of Aboriginal Society, The Remote Aborigines and Outcasts in White Australia. And they were an authoritative confrontation with and challenge to Australian historians who hadn't until that time written very much about colonial history at all. But from then, uh, from then, uh, history took over, as in a sense, as um, writing the interesting and more authoritative and more acceptable uh, um, accounts of of what of things concerning Indigenous people. So, indigen uh, uh, colonial history became a very uh, a major discipline in the 80s. Um, now, what's the important bits I haven't said yet? <laughs> um, oh, the, 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 there were also another big influence, and one on me, uh, was, were the autobiographies of Indigenous people. And um, particularly, where is she? Uh, Sally Morgan's My Place raised sensitive questions that most scholars avoid, still avoid. She revealed that some of the Aboriginal parents instructed their children, tell them you're Indian, a strategy to escape the shame attached to Aboriginal ancestry if you had a dark skin. 
This exposed for me the truly tragic condition that Indigenous heritage had been more shameful than any foreign origin. I've heard, I heard several equivalent stories of a mother denying a dark-skinned Aboriginal relative, etc., in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, I think all that's changed. Well, it's largely changed now. I'd like to hear if people have uh, comments on that particular thing. Um, and in fact, we used that title, Tell Them You're Indian, in a, in a book I put out with Barry Morris um, on Australian, on racism in Australia. Uh, two minutes. <laughs> Teaching Aboriginal studies. I went to Bathurst and taught uh, for 10 years, more or less. Um, and there, uh, I didn't know anything when I first went, in 1980 when I first arrived, I knew nothing about New South Wales Aboriginal people. And um, some of the white students were very eager to explain to me about Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal people that they complained about in much the same terms as the press did. These sort of stories of uh, um, shocking behaviour by the Aboriginal minorities. I wondered why, why, the, you, why the white fellows were so angry and so deeply offended by the Aboriginal people. Um, and so I decided to do some research and the book uh, that was mentioned is the second book on Burke. I wrote two. The first one, I, when I published it, I very carefully disguised the town and the people I spoke to because I was afraid. I mean, that's how bad the violent sort of sense of offence that white fellas had in Burke and in country towns, I imagine, all over New South Wales and Victoria. Um, there was a, a real visceral sense that these people were making claims that should not, that they, they, for things that they weren't entitled to. I'll just see if there's a little bit at the end. Authenticity, native title anthropology. Native title anthropology has saved the classicists. That's the only point I want to make there. Or rather, or rather the... Yes, the classicists in anthropology um, moved very comfortably into the realm of native title. It's well paid, it uh, has a, a very good reputation, you're doing good things, and, um, and you're secure, unlike in the universities these days. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brendan. And, uh I want to thank uh, Uncle Chegg for welcoming us onto Tuabella and Yugara country. And thanks to the organisers for accepting this paper. Um, it's a bit of an experiment, a bit performative. Um, and uh, I want to see if Max comes up on the screen. Hi. <laughs> Can you see me? Hi, Max. How are you going over there in Cambridge, Massachusetts? Yeah, good. Everything's tomorrow with me. No, so are we courageous enough to have this conversation? Yeah, they might not like it, eh? True, we're taking a couple of risks. Like, yarning in the form of a dialogue is not really solid academic work. Oh, sure it is. What about Plato and Socrates? Powerful. Like those two other men, Wadi Gujara, travelling all over the western desert, singing the animals, plants and features of country, calling them into being. Plenty of magical power, those two brothers. They destroyed many evil spirits. That's in Fred Meyer's Pinterby book, page 239, in case people don't believe me. There's an, another risk we're taking here, we're treating white fellow modes of reasoning as if they had their own magical powers. It's reciprocal. If the anthropologist Fred Myers takes the magical powers of the Wadi Kujura seriously, we might have to take seriously the techniques of white fellow uh, rationality and, and the things they do to maintain their power. Yes, so old and new tricks that are part of the continuing violence. Beginning with frontier violence, rhetoric is warfare continued by other means, as well as ideological and inter intellectual strategies for knowledge production, including objectification, positivist factuality, translations into English, omniscient viewpoints, 
and other concepts, tropes and technologies that maintain and control the rules of the game. Are we brave enough to be speculative? This would mean not just describing the situation as a set of facts, but daring to imagine another future that will have come about as the result of Indigenous critique um, being sustained against whitefellow forms of rationality. I think we'd better travel into the future to talk about time. To your museum, Max, the one you created to interrogate whitefellow mischief, Take us on a tour of the Museum of the Magicians of Reason. Happy to. Uh, so it might not look like much on the outside, but inside it's all 2060 high tech. That's right, 40 years in the future. This is our Kalali country, also known as the Channel Country, a bioregion defined by its waterways. It's where my people come from. You take a turn off a dirt track where there is a wooden sign that says museum uh, painted in white and an arrow. A few hundred meters down the track is an old tin shed, a shearing shed surrounded by a few cassia area, <laughs> by a few trees. Um, it looks abandoned at first, but when you go inside, it's all perfect 2060 high tech interior. The living veggie mesh walls are glowing faintly with bioluminescence as they regulate the temperature and humidity to suit the niches where the exhibits are nestled. It's hard to believe they finally listened to indigenous knowledges, isn't it? That the climate catastrophe was slowed down to the point of manageability and that this involved rebooting all kinds of knowledges and technologies. But uh, to start, uh, you want to tell the tourists in the museum what we mean by mischief? Uh, tricks. So tricks of appearances or disappearances, sleight of hand. There's a whole range. What you fellas call reason has its magical tricks, a backbone to a lot of mischief. Actually, I remember talking to you about that back in the 20s. We were inspired at the start by Deleuze and Guattari's response to Goya. Yeah, they reminded us that a vigilant and insomniac rationality creates its own monsters. And time, time must fit into that as well. After all, there's a whole box of tricks associated with time, the kind of time that was a weapon the invaders brought with them to this continent. The concepts, the technologies, the academic discipline of history. We can't unpack all that today, too much stuff. Well, we have a few exhibits in the museum. Ah, yes, each one illustrates a spell and a counterspell like Goya put his faith in reason and Deleuze and Guattari cast a doubt. They knew that the truths of the European Enlightenment were not piling up one by one and the rest of the world was eternally grateful for them. They knew there were other kinds of rationality in the world, including the non-human or more than human rationalities that made their philosophy so expensive. Yeah, here's our, our first exhibit in the brand new temporalities wing of the museum the stages of civilization. This fiction of global time was invented as a justification for imperialism. The Western powers were not just rampaging and pillaging. Oh no, they were bringing civilization to poor, unfortunate peoples who were stuck at earlier stages. Oh, and what counterspell did we have for that one, Stephen? The view from the other side of the frontier, Graeber and Wengro, the dawn of everything, call it indigenous critique. Um, as, oh, you can't see it because of, me. oh yeah, there it goes. Um, that's their definition. And um, <clears throat> they put a guy called Candia Ronk. They put his suppressed voice front and center in their book. Candia Ronk says, I've spent six years reflecting on the state of European society and I still can't think of a single way they act that's not inhuman. And I genuinely think this can only be the case as long as you stick to definitions of mine and thine. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils, the tyrant of the French, the source of all evils, the bane of souls and slaughterhouse of the living. To imagine one can live in a country of money and preserve one's soul is like imagining one could preserve one's life at the bottom of a lake. Arguments like this? had a huge influence on the European Enlightenment. Because of what intellectuals like, intellectuals like 
Kandiaronk was saying, Europeans started to think about egalitarianism and about how their in and how their inherited hierarchies were not a given. Graeber and Wengro say that the stages of civilization trope that we had up there was cooked up by a guy called Turgo in about 1760, precisely as a reaction to this kind of indigenous critique. And yet it's still widely believed that the oldest civilization, oldest continuous civilization on earth is a stone age one, that we were stuck uh, somehow as hunter gatherers until lucky for us, modernity arrived at our shores. Look at the trouble Bruce Pascoe and his dark emu got caught up in, the usual culture wars. But Graeber and Wengro know exactly what Pascoe was talking about. They say that the strength of evidence in dark emu is overwhelming. Indigenous populations were routinely working, cultivating and enhancing their territories and had been for millennia. Making rational decisions about what they how they wanted to live, dialoguing, discussing, negotiating towards consensus, perhaps with a different shape to time, not time as a series of numbers like on the calendar. What an idea. And there's something about whitefellow ways of dreaming that loves to break things up and divide them into components. You see that with whitefellows mistaking country for a singular nature, for instance so as to divide it up into resources and boundaries. It all must be something to do with limits, with order. After all, limits are all about mastery. And the same thing happened with time too. Time shamans of the European Enlightenment spelled out a vision for time that was linear, progressive and moving toward a specific end. And speaking about this new time as if it was a law of nature and as such something that could be harnessed as if by magic. But the best trick of all was to trick everyone else into believing it. Um, the more time could be split up, petitioned, the more control it allowed. Michel Foucault reminds us uh, of this when talking about the control of activity in the making of docile subjects and adjusting the body to temporal imperatives like me meeting targets, being in time and on time. Time became universalized and was turned into a resource to be mined and controlled. And colonization spelled a rupture in time and place. And life was never the same. Time out of place. Now that's a funny thing. Because for blackfellas, time has always uh, been connected to country, to dreaming. Country speaks time. So time was always in place. It was never stripped away or abstracted, but rising out of country. That makes me think of biotemporalities. The technical term for this is phonology. Biotemporalities are an antidote to numerical temporalities. One definition of a whitefellow dreaming could be naturalism with superimposed numerical metrics. What you're saying about partitioning grid patterns in time and space, naturalism, according to anthropologist Philippe Descola, is the European structure of a singular nature coupled with plural cultures. But in totemic or animus systems, Australian cultures are supposed to be totemic, you've got something more like nature cultures where everything is interconnected and alive and we're aware of different living things having their own pace. Everyone, even supposed things, operate on their own time. Like a fly that lives a lifetime in a day or a river that's older than time itself, not rushing anywhere or times corresponding to one another, even, knowing that yams are ready when the grasshoppers come out. They've got a shared becoming and a shared being. Among so-called moderns, we're most often aware of biotemporality around talk of women's biological clocks, a biotemporality that the usual masculinist corporate schedules still find it difficult to accommodate. Reproductive biotemporalities are, of course, primary but that has not stopped machinic organisational temporalities trying to segment and flatten them. Of course, there's nothing clock-like at all about women's reproductive temporalities. <clears throat> a woman might notice a slight dip in the intensity of her monthly estrogen cycle, but it seems to correspond to an anxiety about writing that next book to improve her tracking towards tenure. She might have an attitude towards a potential partner like, oh, what the hell, they'll do. On a first date, this potential partner is not consciously aware of her pheromones, 
but they think she actually is interested in what they have to say about Dungeons and Dragons. So would you say, Stephen, biotemporalities are heterogeneous assemblages of things like lunar cycles, growth and chemo reception? Yes, great definition. Plus, I think it's in tune with a temporal philosophy of imminence, imminent versus transcendent time. Who could possibly think that a concept as slippery as time could be pinned down with numerical apparatuses like calendars and clocks? If we accept that certain biotemporalities can erupt their erupt exerting their living but haphazard forces, precisely the kind of time that the relentless march of numbers is trying to keep at bay, then are we not in the realm of imminent time, temporalities that throb beneath the surface or slowly bulge like the white mushrooms pushing aside pine needles or flicker with silvery flashes like perch in the Bulu River or a pregnant cow whose belly grows with vegetable slowness for nine lunar months all these pulsating forces at their own pace. But time on a transcendent track is telling us to wait for a flip to a higher level when we have left actual life behind and have become nothing less than pure disembodied spirit, the self-realised subject of history projected back as progress towards a future ideal, which often takes the form <coughs> excuse me, of transcendence as profit. The transcendent God, as Deleuze and Guattari put it, is the God who sows and reaps, as opposed to the imminent God who replants and unearths. Transcendence, they say, a specifically European disease. Speaking of dungeons, people are often captivated by the idea of cicadas spending seven years as nymphs in a kind of suspended animation in the dark underground, only to suddenly emerge into the sunlight. This is literally transcendence, is it not? Yes, and um, they metamorphose into different creatures. They must think they're in heaven. They fly around on the breezes, <laughs> in the rain and the sunshine. They have sex, etc., etc. When I was a kid, the varieties used to have names like Cherry Nose, Brown Baker, Red Eye, Green Grocer, Yellow Monday, Whiskey Drinker, Double Drummer and Black Prince. You mythologise them. Of course. That's a way of saying we exchanged power with them. And they die soon after, in a couple of months. You know how you said the time of one thing corresponds to another, yams are ready when the grasshopper comes out? I've heard similar things. When the black flies, sorry, when the black kites are flying over the dunes, the salmon are running. These temporalities are linked up by reckonings that humans make, right? I think so. As opposed to the abstract numerical accounting of things for quantification and marketing. These biotemporalities are singularities, and in the case of human reckonings of them, they can collide or intersect to produce meanings and courses of action. Deborah Bird Rose, in her last book, Shimmer, tells us that eucalypts don't flower just for themselves, but produce their pollen nectar at night in visible light coloured flowers so that their peak of desirability coincides with the nighttime fly-out of their main pollinators, flying foxes, leaving the leftovers for the bees and birds to consume during the day. There's something indivisible and unique about both kinds of singularities, say, flying fox and eucalypt blossom. They're events that make it both unique and common, both an entity of its own perceptual data and a ground for the relation that the monad holds with its environs. So we would like to talk of composed and multiple singularities when it comes to biotemporalities, if indeed the philosophers will allow us to. I think it's like that singularities are events creating environs in places where perception is felt in movement. But moving on to history, Max, what do we have to say? Have you got any exhibits on history in the museum? Yeah, over this way, um, we've got this comet one. An old man in the Kimberley, uh, on being asked when the cattle station was set up, said same time as the comet fell down, as that comet fell down, referring to Halley's Comet in 1910. This is accurate, reliable, historical knowledge, but notice, without numbers. The singularities are expressed by the demonstrative pronouns. That comet, that cattle station, but this exhibit over here is a story that's a bit closer to home for me. 
Many of my relatives were brought up or lived on Sherberg Mission. And for a time they were sent to Palm Island too, after an old grandfather was accused of starting a race riot between the Aboriginal community of Sherberg and the white community at Mergen. An uncle, an uncle tells me that a policeman drew a pistol on my grandfather and um, he wrestled it off him and put, got the pistol in the air and, um, and shot it, stopping the fight. Anyway, both places were uh, set up during the early 20th century with the idea of forcing Aboriginal people into a way of living that started to mirror European ways of living. They called it protection in those early days. On paper, these institutions were meant to act like a cicada, buried away, uh, kept away from the world, locked in another world, so as to be transformed day by day, generation by generation, towards a supposedly civilized condition. The um, mischief of transcendence is right there, eh? spelled out in the language of progress. For sure. And protectors spoke of Aboriginal people as being incapable of change without supervision and restraint. And that was all wrapped up in the pastoral logics of salvation. And for ages, lots of whitefellas were saying that it's a law of nature that Aboriginal people would disappear to make way for whitefella civilization, for progress. By the time protection rolled around, they started saying things like transforming Aboriginal people into so-called civilised subjects was it would mean suspending those laws of nature. So that was their idea of turning Aboriginal people into subjects and objects of history, where history means progress, and progress is as much about destruction as it is about transformation. Yeah, and with that they tried to do this by controlling almost every aspect of Aboriginal people's lives, and time was at the centre of everything. So for much of Sherberg and Palm Island's history during the protection times, they would ring a bell throughout the day. A bell telling people when to wake up, when to gather for roll calls, when to go to work, when to take a break, when the day was over, curfew, and so on. The bell must have been such a strange metallic sound on an ancient continent like axes chopping down trees, gunshots, or the clinking of chains reverberating out of a country and claiming mastery of it through sound. Absolutely. And we have this poem here by Cecil Fisher to remind us. And Fisher goes on to say that the bell rang 11 times between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. each weekday, replaced by sirens years later, which Fisher called the screaming noise from hell. And speaking of, when my family were out on Palm Island, they were placed under the authority of a superintendent named Curry, and he loved the bell. It was all part of him trying to turn the whole island into a prison. He even had jail cells in his backyard. He would beat the bell day and night, trying to control everything. It was enough to drive people Womba mad. But in the end, he was the one that went mad. First, people called him Uncle Boss, but after a while, they knew him as Mad Dog. He was an insomniac, sleepless, agitated, paranoid. He thought he was a god with his belt. And one day, the bell-ringing tyrant sent a telegram to the government promising to clean up Palm Island for good. And that night, he went on a rampage, killing a doctor and his wife for undermining his rule, blowing up his house, walking down the main street, shooting a gun at houses. And the police took too long to arrive from the mainland, so an Aboriginal man ended up having to shoot him in self-defence. That reminds me of Deleuze and Guattari's critique of Goya, it's not the slumber of reason that engenders monsters, but a vigilant insomniac rationality. This time tyrant mad dog sounds like one such monster. I reckon. Eventually, uh, they put up clock towers in places like Palm and Sherberg. It's funny, white fella time, that abstract and unemplaced time, was literally being installed on country, into the landscape. And as well as spying over people all day, keeping them in time and on time, the one at Cherbourg looks like an obelisk, as if clock time always was and always would be. When I was up in Brim, I noticed people don't wear wristwatches. And they also commonly talk about Brim time as a reason for not expecting anyone to turn up for a meeting on time. I was working with old Paddy Rowe and he never had a wristwatch, but he had another gesture for talking about time 
which was a tumbling hands gesture as he said the words generation after generation to talk of his people's ways of living on country. I guess it's a gesture reproducing cyclical kinship. Um, you know, like granny is grandmother and grandchild and skin names are cyclical. You inherit your grandparent's skin name, that sort of thing. Um, it's about uh, life being energised on country, destined to grow generation after generation, time as engendering, not counting. You remember we were both reading Jonathan Lear's Radical Hope about the crow in North America? Yeah, and you ended up calling Paddy Rowe a, a poet of radical hope because he and his other elders had to create a new kind of future. Because he was worried about the future generations. Yeah, and far from being stuck in some prehistory, he was as inventive as any moder modernist. What makes What made time palpable for him as opposed to empty and meaningless, which is what was threatened by cultural genocide and assimilation, was the dreaming, bugadagada, or the law, and boys ready and willing to go through the law. Sorry, I, I get it. You know, what thickens time is culture, not just the ceremony, but all the mundane, everyday stuff uh, that goes into its maintenance. Exactly. I don't like the term deep time much. That, that metaphor, it just extends linearity. I think thickness is all about lovely complexities and entanglements. Yeah, Anna, Anna Clark was a bit suspect of deep time too in her review of the book Everyone, saying, I couldn't help but wonder, does the history disciplines reach into indigenous deep time threaten to colonise a space which has so far eluded Western epistemology? And she refers to the curly questions that not, that's not saying that's not all to say that all the curly questions are answered or reconciled. Clearly, there is questions. There is a question as to how Australian Indigenous texts that are drawn in sand, sung, painted, etched, and walked on country can be rendered into scholarly historical discourse. Yes, these Australian Indigenous texts are multimodal. That is thick not just a thin line of prose in an academic discipline which has forgotten how to make an event of what they want to achieve. This is exactly what happened to Captain Cook in Penny MacDonald's 1989 film Too Many Captain Cooks. It features Rambanga man Paddy Wambaranga telling us with great authority that this was not the historical Captain Cook from 200 years ago, but Captain Cook from a million years ago who brought to the Rambanga in Arnhem Land axes, steel knives. They all come from Captain Cook. It's his song, his story, his painting. Paddy Wambaranga is telling us this as he's recreating the song, the story and the painting in the film right before our eyes. A multimodal performance, an event, not a line of text in a book. But I agree with Anna Clark that it would be worse for history not to try at all. If the current reconciliation push, voice, treaty, truth, ever gets as far as truth, then presumably versions of historical truth will be much in demand. But what other kinds of truth might be important in the Indigenous invader negotiation? How do you deal with the apparent absurdity of the Yolngu cook being from a million years ago? It's a way of saying not everything has to pivot around 1770, that moment called sovereignty or the dawn of modern Australia or the pivot from prehistory to history as if everything suddenly changed at that point. That is a, a trivial apprehension of time. Paddy Wambaranga has appropriated Cook and thickened him up in his own terms with a song, a story, a painting and a dance. He made him real. So when the Yolnu put on impressive performances for visiting dignitaries, the latter are duly impressed, but possibly for the wrong reasons. They think it's culture in the narrow sense, as if real life is happening in some other domain. Well, that was a good little trot. Yeah. So what will we do now? Have we run out of time? Run out like, uh, like that old technology, the hourglass? Seat closure? Recap what we've said. And there it is. There's our slide with our recap on it. So I think we might, um, we might wind it up there. Nice.
Mine's less about the future and more about the dark and scary present. Uh, I uh, wish to thank um, Uncle Chegg for his very beautiful warm welcome to his country. Thank you very much. And uh, I, uh, acknowledge, I would like to thank also the committee for accepting my paper. Thank you, Aileen. I acknowledge the sovereign owners of the Tarrabal and Jagara peoples of this land where we gather today. And in the spirit of my talk, I acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are the land's first storytellers, uh, wisdom holders and uh, song keepers. In this spirit, I want to touch on the question about what constitutes Indigenous studies today from a narrative perspective. So let me begin with a story. Two brothers with a disagreement. One of the brothers believed that you should thank the gods for providing you with sustenance and always leave something behind when you take away from the land. So he was known as a giver. The other brother thought that taking anything from the land without giving was justifiable because it came naturally to him and he saw no reason to give back. Unsurprisingly, he was known as the taker. Some might argue that over time, the taker's way of thinking has come to dominate and inform our current education policies. This dominance reverberates in the ways Indigenous studies have been traditionally designed and implemented in Australia, where non-Indigenous perspectives have been prioritised over Indigenous ones, and there are problems with the system wherever you look. All I can say about that is, Thank God that narrative isn't set in stone. I'd like to consider an Indigenous studies agenda that's shaped by Indigenous perspectives, what I call flipping the script. Not in terms of turning Indigenous studies upside down, but rather a reframing of the discipline across relational lines, both across Indigenous, non-Indigenous processes, and across Indigenous communities within Australia and beyond in the neighbouring Asia-Pacific region. So my position in this relational dialogue is as an outsider, non-Indigenous Australian, a first-generation migrant to Australia, and Indigenous to a community in Asia, where many teachers from my first homeland taught me about our collective history and who I am as an Indigenous person from that part of the world. I also learned from academia, cultural ceremonies, community gatherings, the arts, personal experiences, and through my first language, Kadazan Dusun. I also learned many things from spending time with Indigenous peoples in Australia, sitting with the old people, getting to know elders, listening, walking, talking, listening, listening, listening. Before I say any more on that, I'd like to present some of the questions I've been grappling with. So should Indigenous studies as a discipline have a united voice or like the voice to parliament debate, multiple competing and contradictory voices concerning how it's taught, established and developed? What's the role of non-Indigenous people in debates on what constitutes Indigenous studies? How should Indigenous people contribute as leaders with all the current talk about Indigenous leadership? Are universities ready to be Indigenous-led? So my response to these questions comes in the form of metaphor. Let's return to the narrative. The two brothers exist in the contemporary world their disagreement has been passed down through generations of Indigenous people. And I should mention this is a story from my culture, which is located geographically just uh, north of Australia in a place called Borneo, East Malaysia. The giver embodies the spirit of respect for Indigenous knowledge systems. He understands that taking something from the land requires recipro reciprocity, acknowledgement and appreciation for what he's received. His approach is to give back to honour his identity and communal relationships with the natural world. The taker, on the other hand, represents colonial dominance, 
this taking perspective is, is a view where power imbalance is perpetuated through repression, exploitation and expo extraction of Indigenous knowledge. He, ignore, he ignores his responsibility to give back to the land which ultimately over time leads to cultural erasure. This story highlights inequality and the implications of non-Indigenous complicity. How do we correct the narrative of imbalance and make Indigenous issues more expansive? I don't teach in an Indigenous studies unit. I work at one of the universities that has an underfunded unit. My teaching on Indigenous Australian issues comes out of my research and my cultural history. In my discipline of media and cultural studies, I incorporate this cultural research in my teaching, mainly to get students in my discipline to consider their place in the world and in Indigenous Australia, because otherwise they'd go through their whole degree without much of an engagement with Indigenous issues. They might have to complete some kind of online cultural competency course uh, or they might find themselves part of the various experiments a university engages, sometimes called indigenising the curriculum. Uh, my goal today is not to discuss how to create space for Indigenous knowledge to exist in the institution. I don't wish to dwell on the how of how to get to an ideal model of critical Indigenous studies. There's no doubt that more funding is needed for Indigenous studies and more Indigenous staff employed at universities. Everyone else in the system could be dedicated to working with Indigenous scholars, elevating Indigenous voices, decolonising institutional culture, and embedding Indigenous knowledge in ways where it's not separated from the people connected to that knowledge. Are we ever going to get there? With less and less funding going to universities, it seems a hard slog. This is the reason why I would rather talk about the product rather than the process. The product. Indigenous studies should be a non-negotiable in the education system, showing us how to think like the giver brother, offering lessons on how to listen, giving ourselves over to Indigenous worldviews. A non-negotiable system reflects the diverse realities of Indigenous people challenges assumptions about Indigenous life and dismantles colonial structures. We shouldn't have to debate how to live on this land moving forward if we are to listen to the laws of this land and the First Peoples. This is why I want to present an expansive approach that demonstrates how critical Indigenous studies might look as a mutual ob obligation across histories of oppression and colonialism. I'm talking about a relational space where we might look to Indigenous cultures beyond Australia, but also minority ethnic groups within Australia in ways that allow us to draw comparisons and share experiences of struggle and endurance. The narrative again. One brother said to the other, at some part, stage of the story, are we there yet? No, not yet, said the other brother. Whenever I think of conversations like this, I'm reminded of what a critic once remarked about Samuel Beckett's two-act play, Waiting for Godot. The critic said, it's a play where nothing happens twice. This is not literally true, though the play has no story, no plot, and not much of a setting, merely a rock, a scrawny tree that sprouts leaves in the second part to mark the passage of time, a deserted country road and the sky. My point is, what are we waiting for? In the cultural walking trails I make, we judge our wrong, wrong storytellers on country in central Victoria. We talk a lot about what uh, that deserted country road and the endless expanse of sky. What are we waiting for? I once asked one of the uncles of the Jara people. We're certainly not waiting for the white fella to get his shit together, he said. So I'm on that dirt track 
making my way out of the wilderness. And to my surprise, I find there's a story here I can connect to. There's a story about two feuding volcanoes that is similar to the one in my culture about the brothers. The volcanoes are competing about which one will blow their lava furthest, how much of the land they can destroy in their pursuit to be bigger and better. The story goes that the two volcanoes made a pact to allow the one who could travel further to win, but as fate would have it, they ended up tied and both were able to claim victory in the end. This story reminds me of debates we have had and continue to have in this country about coexistence, with one group trying to one up or fix all the problems of the other. We're now also part of another different debate about our coexistence with nature and humanity, the climate chaos that surrounds us. That's what I think about when I hear stories like the volcano story trying to do things bigger and better than before. Flipping the script to make this narrative of imbalance more expansive demands that we engage not just in courageous conversations, but uncomfortable ones. This is not just about how to stand with Indigenous peoples, but holding space for our own intentions in that dialogue. When to shut up and simply listen, when to do the hard work that needs to be done so that the rightful Indigenous leaders can get on with the job. In my homeland, Borneo, there are more than 300 Indigenous groups that make up the majority of the island. The people have endured multiple colonial regimes and we continue to come under the power of an Islamic neo-colonial state that is repressive and entangled in its own violent bureaucratic tentacles. So in my lifetime, I don't ever expect to see an Indigenous Studies unit at any one of those universities. But what I will say is that the wilderness is actually our university and part of the reason why in my culture we have uh, more than a million speakers of the language, despite the language not being taught at school. Uh, the wilderness, despite most of it being gone, 60% of it gone, um, in some ways uh, enables the culture because we, uh, we fight. We fight for the language, we fight the culture and the laws in that cult in, on the land. Uh, the guise of oppression and repression may have changed, but the way we experience these neo-colonial practices are still all too familiar for Indigenous people across the world. So I just wanted to come back to your question, Brendan, about whether the uh, Indigenous, um, Indigenous studies should be part of the Western Academy. And uh, in the case of Borneo, there's an example where it's not, but... Um, the culture thrives despite that. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. Borneo is where I have taken Australian students over the years to witness firsthand questions of coexistence and sustainability. Students learn in an environment of cultural care, immersion and collaboration. Elders have opportunities to present their knowledge to the unfamiliar visitor. The wilderness beyond is rich with questions challenging assumptions about Indigenous resistance and adaptability. The multiple political ecological issues in this landscape provide the perfect classroom backdrop. Despite cultural differences, the focus is to centre Indigenous wisdom in forms that inspire change and challenge the thinking of and assumptions um, of the student cohort. Let me say a few things about Borneo as a site of learning. So due to decades of logging and land clearing for agriculture, more than 60% of the rainforest is now gone. Unsustainable palm oil production has contributed to most of the devastation of forest areas. This polluted and fragile environment has made it difficult for communities to find the forest resources they need to survive. Uh, some things about the Indigenous peoples of that land, uh, despite enduring the impacts of multiple colonial and present day neo-colonial rule, the people have found a way to sustain connection to land and traditions. Teachings through ongoing practices such as dance, conversing in the native mother tongue and participation in ceremonial and communal life offer lessons on caring for nature, 
and humanity. Thank you. Land and river systems have been destabilised to such an extent that communities of villages along a major river system have reduced fishing to once a year. That day has become a day of sharing among the villagers. That day has become a celebration of survival. A few things about Australian students in Borneo. Taking them beyond an Australian context made them feel safer to look at their own issues in their backyard. Many do not know how to talk about their place in Indigenous Australia. They are afraid to explore their own privilege. They fear engaging in debates that matter to Indigenous peoples. Students are afraid to make mistakes, say the wrong things or ask the wrong questions. And yet witnessing the struggles of other Indigenous nations put a spotlight on the complexities of First Nations here. Students questioned their own assumptions. They were able to glimpse, glimpse the land through the people's eyes. The collective human story here is about being present and making present a value-laden sharing economy. The law of the land tells us how to act with nature and each other. How we act with each other in this learning is also about relational accountability. I'm not for a moment saying that uh, we merge Asian Indigenous studies with Indigenous studies, but rather that we find ways to make Indigenous issues relational and relevant to our specific disciplines. Back on home soil in Australia, relationality can adopt many forms. Let me share another memory. In a quiet part of Victoria called Castlemaine, people are walking through a park filled with the sounds of bird life and the scent of leaves after rainfall. Here, there's a beautiful relational way to engage with Indigenous history. Children run ahead of us as we walk the trail, listening to an elder story about how much this land has changed. There was once a man called John King, who was the only person to have survived the ill-fated Birkin Wills expedition in 1861. There's a monument on this walk that has King's name etched in gold, boldly proclaiming his name as King Survivor. However, there is nothing on this monument about the Yandruwanda people who saved him. The Indigenous people in this part of our history remain unacknowledged on this monument. When the children see the gold embossed King Survivor on the monument, they raise a flurry of questions. With their curious minds, the children are not afraid to ask all the right questions. Why was he a king? What did he survive? Who's this monument for anyway? As we let those questions sit uncomfortably, we keep walking, using the outdoors as a classroom where Jar Jar Rung leaders are holding their own space. If we look to the land for answers, one of the storytellers notes, the answers are there in our landscape. The teachings and lessons on how to act exist on country. The point I want to make is that policies and practices of government, corporations and institutions like universities can't work for Indigenous people unless those policies and practices are brought into alignment with Indigenous knowledge systems. This alignment would include ways for us to engage with land, water and resource-based issues in ways that allow us to understand how to act on country. Understanding Indigenous ways of doing history would be a first step, by which I mean understanding ceremony and ritual, imagining the significance of culture and language, learning on country. Efforts to establish more Indigenous studies units and schools within universities should not be an afterthought or merely a response to meet another policy around inclusion and cultural diversity. These endeavours should not be up for debate, but rather a definitive commitment where Indigenous knowledge is centred and grounds institutional knowledge. The kind of relational thinking I've discussed today necessitates a good hard look at our own roles, and this is where we have to talk about process, how we put pressure on the institution to write the balance, 
how we use our positions of power to push up against the machine, how we call out those complicit with the dominant system, how we allow ourselves and our own precious projects to be Indigenous-led. These principles are not abstract. They are pivotal to forging peace with Indigenous communities and with the natural world itself. An institution grounded in Indigenous knowledges reflects a grand vision of education and community. This vision would address the realities and relationalities of history making in the present, the ongoing plight of Indigenous misrecognition and coexistence in shared landscapes. And on all these matters, we need, we need more than simply stories. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers and Uncle Teg for um, bringing us here and welcoming us here today um, for these really um, important um, conversations. Um, I think I'll shift from being a, participating in a courageous conversation to kind of put forward a very nervous conversation here. Um, so I, do forgive me. I've only been giving papers on Zoom for the past few years, um, tucked away in Perth. So um, this is quite daunting. All right. So to start, first I must acknowledge the Jagara and Turrbal people. Um, traditional owners of Mianjin, where we meet today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also want not to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people, on whose Buja I'm very privileged to live and work. So my paper today concerns Indigenous history, um, which I want to argue constitutes a core part of Indigenous studies. Despite colonial tropes that Indigenous people were historyless and ostensibly um, lived in a static state, Narrating the past through genealogies, stories, ceremony, song, design, both sacred and mundane, and so on, has long played a very important role in Aboriginal societies, particularly in informing how people should relate to both others and the wider world around them. So further, I'd argue investigating colonial discourses, including both their historical impacts and their legacies today, as well as agentic Indigenous responses then and now, arguably animate critical Indigenous scholarship and calls to decolonise the academy. So here we can think of Martin Nakata's critique of the Cambridge expedition, for example, and its ongoing legacy in terms of how education in the Torres Strait was conceived. Further Indigenous history has often been a foundational unit in the teaching of Indigenous, Australian, of Indigenous studies here in Australia, certainly was in the four universities in which I've taught Indigenous studies. This is because it orients students to the contributing factors that shaped contemporary Indigenous experience, particularly colonial dispossession and the ongoing practical economic and social marginalisation. In addition to these important factors, Indigenous history has diverse approaches, sources and interpretive frames. And the methods of academic history can seem opaque to those outside of the academy. And perhaps in contrast to other sort of academic disciplines, the fact that history, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous history, is also practised by amateur or lay historians means that it has a much broader audience, or a broader base of invested practitioners. So for all these reasons, we can see Aboriginal history is subject to ongoing politicisation, um, particularly when we look to school curricula, national commemorations, and debates sparked by controversial revisionist works, such as Keith Winshuttle's fabrication of Aboriginal history in the early 2000s, and more recently, the um, critical responses to Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu. As a consequence of these multiple factors, Indigenous history feels like one of the most contested fields of study, with diverse competing claims of ownership. Since its formal inception as an academic field in the 1970s, it has been subject to multiple ways of debate and soul searching over who has the right to tell Aboriginal history and how it should be told. These debates and reflections have not only been sparked by Indigenous interventions, asserting that Aboriginal history should be the preserve of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 
but also by post-structural critique of Western historiography's pretense that history can only be reduced to a singular narrative, recovered through a dispassionate, objective interrogation of the evidence. Consequently, whether explicitly acknowledged or not, works of Indigenous history are imbued with a range of ethical choices and decisions. This is neither surprising nor unique to history, but the point nonetheless needs to be stressed. This is because the question of ethics can often be construed in terms of formal policies and procedures, governed by, um, you know, often governed by HREX. Thus historians, except for those drawing on oral histories or highly sensitive materials such as protection records, usually did not have to engage um, in these formal ethic processes. So we've not had to really explicate what our ethical principles are. However, with the advent of the new Indigenous Studies field of research codes, which subsume Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history within Indigenous studies and not historical studies, and the new 2020 IATSIS Code of Ethics for Indigenous research, which expands the definition of research and also the jurisdiction of ethics committees, it seems that Indigenous history has arrived at uh, crossroads, and again, not for the first time. And it is now time to reflect more explicitly on what it means to approach Indigenous history ethically. So I'd like to begin by exploring what constitutes Aboriginal history. As Bain Atwood explains in Telling the Truth about Aboriginal history, the field can be defined in multiple ways, with significant blurring between what some might call Aboriginal history and what others might call settler history or even Australian national history. Some works focus on the largely pre-colonial worldview of Aboriginal people or Aboriginal narratives or memories explaining the past, including the colonial past, in Indigenous terms. And this is exemplified, for instance, by Paddy Wambarunga's Too Many Captain Cooks, who have already been introduced to. Others explore the histories of interaction between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, or the construction and legacies of racial, governmental, legal and cultural discourses on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I would actually contend that all of these different fields, all of these different approaches constitute Aboriginal history, even those which may, you know, distastefully reduce Indigenous people to objects rather than active subjects of study. Because I would say that all of these approaches can illuminate the historical experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including the ways in which we're envisaged within the nation state. And of course, even these more objectionable histories provide opportunities for critique, as Greg Lehman did in his response to the, um, the you know, Keith Winshuttle during the history wars. So, you know, I would kind of always want to argue for, you know, we need these histories so we can respond to them and, you know, refine and develop our thinking. Following the 1967 referendum, which was framed as extending equality and citizenship to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, WEH Stanner expressed to national audiences the need to understand Aboriginal people's experiences of the past, arguing that the omission of Indigenous people from historical narratives represented the great Australian silence. He rightly predicted that this silence would be shattered by a new wave of historians, and the field was formalised the following decade when the eponymous journal Aboriginal History was founded. The early editors were insistent, oh sorry, the early editors' vision reflected their own principles. They were insistent that Aboriginal history should centre on Indigenous perspectives, and not as its influential early editor Diane Barwick attested, race relations nor should it seek to tell the stories from the white man's point of view. Here the journal distinguished Aboriginal history from his histories of colonialism, not only in terms of the subject of inquiry, but also in terms of its ethos. Its editors saw histories of colonialism as centred on the destruction, degradation and decline of Aboriginal culture, and which denied Indigenous agency, whereas they envisaged the new interdisciplinary field of Aboriginal history as elucidating the survival of an autonomous Indigenous world and its adaptation to the colonial presence in ways that both shaped Aboriginal people and their sense of selves. These early works in Aboriginal history introduced readers and students to histories of the frontier violence and massacres, as well as Indigenous experiences of the pastoral industry and collaborative narratives of mission life. 
It was perhaps this commitment to portraying Indigenous perspectives which sparked concerns in the 1980s about the appropriation of the Aboriginal past as an act of neocolonialism. In 1981, Wayne Atkinson, Michael Williams, Doreen Wanganeen and Marcia Langton, members of the Aboriginal Historians for the Bicentenary History Working Party, launched an important intervention into Aboriginal history. Oh my God, I'm so, I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, exploring the question, why can't white historians write Aboriginal history? In response, they reflected on international um, decolonisation movement, arguing that just as colonised people and oppressed Indigenous peoples have insisted that their histories and cultures are their own to be portrayed and represented to their own people, Aboriginal people are reclaiming their history and culture. Yet as Anna Cole, Vicky Haskins and Fiona Paisley suggest in Uncommon Ground, the Working Party were more concerned with urging Aboriginal people to write their own histories, rather than simply demanding that non-Aboriginal people did not. However, the very fact that they posed this very important question sent a clear message to non-Aboriginal historians, forcing them to consciously reflect on their own involvement in this field. Such demands were not unique to Australia and reflected broader arguments about subaltern representation. As Linda Tuhiwai Smith explained, we have often allowed our histories to be told and have then become outsiders as we heard them being retold. Suspicions about appropriation would have been escalated by the palpable barriers Indigenous people faced in the making of our own history. Henrietta Famille, in her influential 1989 essay, Who Owns the Past? Aborigines as Captives of the Archives, argued that ownership and control of Aboriginal historical resources are denied us, identifying the practical challenges Indigenous people faced in accessing records kept in metropolitan archives, which she stressed were legally owned by the states or repository rather than the Indigenous person who the records pertain to. She asked whether it is a deliberate government policy to prevent Aboriginal people from accessing these records in order to maintain our ignorance for political purpose. This speculation is arguably supported by Lauren Marsh and Steve Kinane's research on the ghost files of the West Australian Department of Indigenous Affairs Archives, which suggests that records were disposed of at a very alarming rate, much like they quote in the aftermath of other repressive regimes. These disposals did not end until the 1997 Royal Commission of Aboriginal Deaths in Custody findings, which called for a moratorium on the destruction of records leading Marsh and Kinane to lament the implications of these lost records for family history and also in terms of native title research. Yet control and appropriation were not the only reason for Indigenous criticisms of white historians writing Aboriginal history. There was also concern about political representation and whether non-Indigenous historians might whitewash Aboriginal history and perpetuate what Atkinson and others described as a colonialist propaganda and the denial of our set of truths about the devastating impact of colonisation. Such suspicions would have been compounded by traditional Western historiographical views which dismissed Aboriginal derived sources such as oral histories, songs, narratives, performances and so on because they ostensibly lacked empirical rigour or dispassionate objectivity. Yet research by Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars in other disciplines, such as Clint Bracknell on songs and language, and Patrick Nunn and Nicholas Reed's research on stories about coastal inundation thousands of years ago, have highlighted the limitations of that scepticism about Aboriginal sources. These debates about who owns the past compelled some non-Indigenous historians to reflect on their own ethical principles. Greg Denning, for instance, admitted that it was a kick in the stomach to hear Frantz Fanon's contention that outsider historians who had benefited from the powers of the victors should not write subaltern history. While he disagreed with that assertion, with the assertion that an outsider could not access the minds and histories of the other, such interventions help Denning to understand that the past ultimately belongs to those on whom it impinged, more than those who had the skills to discover it and tell it. Denning's epiphany also highlights the need to recognise the effective sensibilities of these histories to Indigenous readers and how they might respond to the scholarship. <clears throat> 
As Nakata observes, for Indigenous academics and students, reading our histories is not just an intellectual process, it also represents an emotional journey, because as Bronwyn Fredericks adds, our feelings are stirred whenever we read something that mirrors elements in our own lives and the lives of family, friends and community members, revealing the ways in which history is not just relegated to the past, but is a living, organic thing that we continue to experience and feel. The recognition of the emotional toll of history for Indigenous people has led to calls for a greater historiographic ethos of compassion. Barry Judd and Kat Ellinghouse have warned against history becoming too inward-looking and disconnected from society, arguing that emotions, including sadness, distress, anger, desire and love, that rightly belong to Aboriginal people and their remembrance of ancestors and times past, needs to be examined by historians as part of their empathetic engagement with the colonial past. For them, it also entails a compassionate fidelity to their Indigenous sources, even if this evidence challenges macro interpretations. In Judd and Ellinghouse's case, it's by paying respect to the genuine affection expressed by their Aboriginal women co-collaborators, including Judd's mother, towards the German missionary um, F.W. Albrecht, even at the risk of this work seemingly reconfiguring a colonialist white man as the central act actor in Australian history narratives. These kinds of ethical reflections have arguably resulted in significant shifts in approach. For example, there's now more attentive, attentiveness towards the particularities of local history, construed through the prism of specific language groups and clans, rather than more generic, homogenising, um, sorry, more homogenising discussions of Aborigines or Blacks, as, as uh, Henry Reynolds often used to write, or Natives. There's also been a move towards more collaborative research relationships, whereby the older problematic dynamic of white researchers seemingly mining native informants for information to satisfy their own interests is giving way to more cooperative partnerships. Now Indigenous people are more likely to be regarded as collaborators than they were in the past, and in some cases as co-authors sharing knowledge that's meaningful to them. These are evidence in the growth of collectively produced local uh, community histories many of which are published by Magabala Books, which I'll spruik. So in addition to this scholarly reflection of um, individual historians' principles, questions over who has the right to tell Aboriginal history has also led to changes in ethical protocols. And in some cases, it's improved access conditions. Um, so for example, State Library of Victoria's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Cultural Permissions Program, which Maxine Briggs explains, puts the authority to access images of Indigenous people into the hands of the Aboriginal descendant rather than the institution itself, and significantly opens up a discussion between parties around the use of the image of their ancestors. But access protocols can also be seen as inhibiting research. Peter Reid observed that significant large-scale pro projects on, on, um, on Aboriginal colonisation conducted in the 1980s by the likes of Henry Reynolds and Heather Goodall were based on huge sets of records that would no longer be possible due to these privacy police policies, which he suspects is a strategy to prevent archive-based revelations occurring. So we can think about the stolen generations, which shifts people's individual stories into a broader recognition of the wide-scale um, system, you know, systematic removal of children. Indigenous researchers have also identified issues with, in, with ethics protocols. Not the principle of the protocols, I should stress, but rather their implementation at, um, in the hands of risk-averse bureaucratic HREX. These criticisms have ranged from the paternalism of a priori constructions of Indigenous people as vulnerable or high risk, and um, to others, um, Hawkes, Pollock, Judd, Phipps and Asulin's criticism that the bureaucratic demands to formalise relationships between Indigenous communities and researchers with consent forms and contracts, um, sorry, they've criticised this attempt to formalise relationships in a bureaucratic way, overlooking the legacies of colonialism which might make Indigenous participants, um, you know, anxious and nervous about, um, or, you know, the histories of su surveillance um, and governmental intervention, which would um, 
make individuals nervous about this kind of um, contracts being signed. The new IATSIS code has also expanded the definition of Indigenous research to include all research activities, not just those involving participants, but also those using archives, data sets, collections, um, and research involving Indigenous people, societies, culture, knowledge, and policies and experiences. Again, at first glance, this seems like a very important change. But as the chair of my university's Indigenous Research Ethics Panel, I'm worried about how we will actually implement this policy and what the potential ramifications could be. If it was widely adopted by researchers, I would fear that I would spend all of my time assessing proposals and facilitating other people's research rather than getting on with my own research, or alternatively, I'm going to be tokenistically invited or you know, pulled into other people's research programs just as a way for them to kind of um, cynically or perhaps naively comply with these new ethics codes. But my greater fear, however, is that this will deter researchers from engaging in Indigenous research. This stems from many conversations I've had with other historians who I feel are very ethically minded and are looking at the ethics and thinking it's no longer ethical, ethically appropriate for them to be working in the field. I worry that it's going to be the ethically minded ones who will leave and move to other fields, perhaps settler colonial studies, which I feel is way too blunt and reduces Indigenous people to abstracts by its kind of, you know, dominant focus on elimination. Whereas I would prefer to keep these people within Indigenous history, where we can do nuanced studies of the pluralist experiences of Indigenous communities and write agentic histories that benefit communities. In terms of practicalities, as a historian, and here I'm inspired by a conversation with Aileen, what are the practical considerations of being able to set out your project in an a priori way before you even get into the archives? It's the assumption that archives are neat, perfect, you can easily identify what you're going to look for, develop a pre-project proposal, which is what the IATSIS code recommends, go in, do your research as if you can easily identify the community um, that can give you permission to look at it let alone thinking about the contestation within communities, um, partly sparked by native title. So I'm working with a community that's having a lot of problems in that regard. So I just feel that the ethics protocols are an unwieldy, or I fear that they may be an unwieldy tool um, that is going to have these unintended consequences. So I better stop there, I've gone over time, but I really just wanted to stress that when we look at ethics, we have to think about the ethics of the individual researcher and not assume that or, you know, there are researchers who are going to be unethical and need to be guided by protocols. You know, I just think that um, I wanted to trace that these more organic shifts in people identifying their own personal ethics and principles that have happened in my discipline over time. Thank you. Yeah, pulling in our mena palua, waranda palua di amena loiti anena, waranda loiti anena. Um, in the language of my palua ancestors, the Trollway people, well said, got that right. Um, I've just acknowledged that I bring, I stand here with my ancestors alongside of me, as do we all, and um, just acknowledge the obligations for um, for generosity and respect that that reality brings to us. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge Uncle Chegg um, for his generous welcome and also acknowledge the unceded sovereign owners, elders, cultural knowledge holders and practitioners of Mianjin and uh, express my appreciation for the ability to speak on Turbul and Yagara country. I'm also really glad to be collaborating on this uh, with Reby Taylor who has been a friend and colleague for 25 years or so. Um, I'd like to preface our presentation on a publication exploring some questions about genocide in Australia by personalising this. My point is that genocide is more than a contested proposition in the discourse of Australian history. So I'll say a few words about my personal practice as an art historian which is almost entirely in response to this contestation. 
And finally, my family's personal experience of genocide. But first I'll start with a little story. <clears throat> Michael Mansell and I bumped into one another in the mid-1990s at Adelaide Airport. And as we were standing there yarning, a woman came up and stood alongside of us, waiting for a break in the conversation to say something to us. Mick just winked at me and continued talking to see what she would do. After a couple of minutes, her patience ran out and she exploded at us. We should have shot yous out when we had the chance. She bawled out at the top of her voice to these two pale-skinned, blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aborigines. There was no rejection of our cultural identity in that moment. The genocidal impulse was alive and well in that moment. So what was all that about? My research and curatorial practice over the past 15 years has been exactly about that question. My way into this is to try to address the appalling level of visual literacy in Australia and encouraging people to recognise that artworks, especially colonial artworks, <clears throat> carry ideologies and tropes that should be mapped as part of Australia's truth-telling if we are to better understand how we got into the mess that the No campaign has so dramatically demonstrated we are currently in. A couple of quick examples of how insidious Australia's visual rhetoric has been. This wonderful image, one of the images that I've been obsessing about for the last decade or so, uh, is a drawing by uh, the artist on Cook's Third Voyage, John Webber, of a meeting between Captain James Cook and a group of Nyonane men at Adventure Bay on Bruny Island. Cook's shown presenting a medal, uh, one of a number of medals that were struck for his second and third voyage for distribution to native peoples across the, uh, across the Pacific. It's a meeting of sovereigns, sovereign people, a representative of empire and local sovereigns of their country. There's some respect and dignity in the meeting. What a great way to have started the whole business. This is how that meeting was articulated as an expression of Australia's enthusiasm around um, becoming this new nation of Australia at Federation. The equation of power has obviously changed dramatically. And I would argue that this continues to speak to Australia's expectations of Aboriginal people today. Similarly, this is, um, and I could talk about this particular subject a lot, but there is a, a profound visual silence um, of Aboriginal people in colonial landscape painting uh, in Van Diemen's land prior to the arrival of Benjamin Judero and John Glover. Um, in all the research that Tim Boney, Hady and I did for the National Picture Exhibition at the National Gallery, this is the only painted image, um, and there are a couple of um, uh, pencil drawings that accompany this, the only painted image of of a, a, a frontier conflict um, uh, that, um, that emerged from what I'm sure everybody understands was a particularly bloody um, uh, period in Australia's history. Yet, it's these sort of images that, um, that give us examples of how Australia has so successfully mythologised its practice of genocide to resemble nation building, um, heroism and pioneering spirit. Yet Australia's ability to critically read this visual history is verging on the illiterate. Even some images that should speak unambiguously of the processes at play are blurred in our national history. The black line if it was to occur anywhere in, a, in the world today, would be recognised as a classic deployment of ethnic cleansing. The objective in this case was referred to at the time as extermination, exile beyond, beyond the boundaries of the settlement of, Aboriginal, of all Aboriginal people remaining on the island to Flinders Island, where they were to be held until they died. That Flinders Island, Wyblina and Flinders Island, was Australia's first example of permanent offshore detention, something that we still practice. <clears throat> 
This painting is recognised by the Australian Museum of Democracy as one of Australia's founding documents, yet it illustrates the making of a treaty that was broken before it was made. And the artist Benjamin Dutero understood this. He arrived with sympathy for Aboriginal people because he was a Huguenot. His, both his grandparents had been, um, had been imprisoned in France following the revocation of the Treaty of Nantes. He understood through his family history the consequences of the St Bar Bartholomew's Day massacres where over 5,000 French Protestants were murdered on the streets of Paris. He gave us a document that is misread in, in, in current Australian visual history. What happened in Tasmania was widely understood across the British Empire during the late 19th century, but strangely we seem to have lost touch with, with that understanding. H.G. Wells predicated his War of the Worlds on the experience of Tasmanian Aboriginal people against their invading aliens. Raphael Lemkin, in coining the term genocide in 1948, referred to Tasmania as a, as a defining case study. So we need to look at the familiar images from our colonial history differently. They are not quaint or exceptional, they are typical. And like the experience of Jewish, Roma and other peoples of the Third Reich, this experience leaves multi-generational consequences, despite what Jacinta Price might like to say. This is one of the women uh, who were pictured in that tableau um, uh, pre uh, prior to this. Her name is Wapiti or Watamoti, Watania, Kutania, Kutania Watamina, which means thunder and lightning. Uh, she was the, um, uh, the sister of my tribal ancestor, Waratamotiena. This is her, um, her grand niece, who married an English, um, an English farmer and um, gave rise to my family. There's, um, there's their, their son, the oldest man there is their son, Thomas Herps. Um, his daughter, um, the woman, the older woman sitting next to him, uh, Mary Kathleen. Um, my grandmother standing behind, um, Mary, Mary Christina, and um, my auntie, dad's oldest sister, uh, Auntie Noreen, in the front. And this, to your audience, is me. After more than 50 years, I'm still the same person, doing the same thing. I'm a product of my family's historical experience, but I've graduated from a toy ray gun to a pen. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, yes, so to touch on what Greg was speaking about earlier, um, the eminent juris, Jewish jurist Lemkin did mint a new word in 1943. Genocide is a 20th century term, but it describes an ancient phenomenon and can be used to analyse the past. The 1948 United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide is an international legal treaty. And these are the main parts of that um, crime, committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part. Uh, with the understanding that genocide has an ancient history, Ben Kiernan uh, edited and brought together uh, co-editors of three volumes that were published this year, The Cambridge World History of Genocide, and I co-edited uh, volume two. Volume two offers empirical evidence of genocide from across five centuries of European settler colonial history. So this is from the modern times to the turn of the 20th century. It maps settler colonial genocides of the 19th century, which uh, uh, include Algeria, the American interior, and the Australian continent. There are many differences between all these colonies, but what connects them is that their histories are genocidal the goal of imposing a new settler society on Indigenous lands. Now, these are the table of contents um, from volume two, and I've highlighted the chapters that are by and about, by Australian scholars about Australia. So it's quite a large uh, contribution to this international 
and widespread history from the 16th century to the turn of the 20th century. And I've just added the work there by Crystal and Joanna on stolen gens in um, the volume three. So what was interesting about Tasmania and the idea of genocide is that Lemkin recognised very early in his scholarship, as Greg said, that Tasmania constituted a clear case of genocide. This was partly because there was a lot of writing about the history of Tasmanian colonisation dating from the very time of colonisation. And the idea of extinction created a discourse of deep criticism within British imperialist writing. And that created a discourse that caught the attention of Lemkin. I've written earlier that, that genocide and the idea of extinction by the 1970s, 1970s actually blurred into the one kind of synonym, which has meant that um, in some cases, the notion of genocide has been a word that's been avoided in the context of Tasmania by scholars in the late 20th century. Um, however, in mainland Australia, the, the notion of genocide really wasn't part of scholarly conversations until the 1980s and 90s. And Tony Barto identified the prime relations between settler colonists and Indigenous Australians as relations of genocide. And Tony was a scholar of German history, and he understood that the act of taking land on which people were primarily required for their survival of their well-being, their economic well-being and their cultural well-being was an act of genocide and there was clear intent in that dispossession. Perhaps more famously the work of Patrick Wolfe followed and in 1999 said that settler colonies are premised on the elimination of the First Peoples because the colonisers come to stay. In other words, he was comparing somewhere like Australia or America with colonies where governments at least changed their colour. But in Australia and in America and Canada, the governments have uh, a consequence of the original colonisation. Settler colonialism has created this body of scholarship that's concluded that much genocidal violence in Australia's colonial history is based on this notion of replacement and dispossession that it was often sporadic and unplanned and passively sanctioned because in the construct of the settler colonial notion, you don't need to look for specific intent in written records because it's there in the clear act of dispossession. However, what this chapter is uh, in part three of volume two, I think is marking a historiographical shift in that scholarship. So what we see is that Lyndall Ryan's work on the colonial, on the massacre map um, and it had led her to make a very important contribution to volume two of the Cambridge World History of Genocide. She has recorded 290 massacres in Australia from 1794 to 1928, um, and resulting in a number of deaths which uh, is very serious to the ongoing well-being of um, society. And she says her findings are provisional that the massacres documented will likely increase, but the conclusion will not alter that frontier massacres were an integral part of Australia's colonial history. It's a pattern of, not, of systematic and systemic policy. My own chapter looked, uh, extended the work by James Boyce and Lyndall Ryan and looked at, again, systematic massacres occurring in Van Diemen's land, especially following the order of 1826 that district massacres could sanction military-led parties to pursue Palawa people um, and then use political rhetoric of humanitarian protection to uh, frame these clear genocidal actions. Rhetoric that I should add uh, enabled the British to justify their expansion into Victoria, South Australia and New Zealand, directly following. Raymond Evans' chapter on Queensland, it's the first history to encompass a geographical sweep of the North in the framework of genocide. And it shows that with each colony, the British settlers became more audacious. The numbers killed in each massacre rose with each colony. 
and importantly found that Coniston um, 1928 is not the last massacre that massacres continued into the 1940s. So what, what I initially thought after having written this and, and talked to Lyndall Ryan and it was her who said to me via email, we need a new book called Genocide in Australia that takes the concept of clear policies of massacres against the more recognised genocide of the stolen generations and really focuses the lens that has been, uh, that's been done in the international context in Australia. And uh, when I spoke to Ben Kiernan and asked if he'd like to be part of it, his response is, yes, but you must have the word resistance in there. His own work on Cambodia had been very interested in resistance. And when I recently was talking to Greg about getting ready for today, he said, but what, what is that resistance? What form does it take? What are the Indigenous responses? This is the proposed title of the book that we want to take to publishers. We've started to talk to contributors, but we are still in our own minds thinking through these key questions. Ben Kiernan's very interested in question number two. Is settler colonialism and genocide synonymous? And can we investigate that question further? I'm very interested in question number one. If you look at the first colonies, they are very clearly governed and directed from Britain. Once we get into the early 19th century, into the 1820s, there's a lot more independence. So who is responsible? And after 1901, well, of course, genocide becomes an Australian crime. So I think a book needs to deal with those questions in those historical parts, the very early, the more independent period, but still colonial and then post-colonial, uh, well, you know, post-federation, not post-colonial. Um, and why now? Well, we're in a time of truth calls for truth-telling and treaty. Is that 22 minutes until we're at 20 minutes? Yeah, okay. So what we actually wanted to do was discuss this together, didn't we, Greg, this notion of resistance. Would you mind if I just in two minutes said something about that? Or do you want to...? There was something when I was editing volume two that really stuck with me. Carl Jacoby's chapter looks at indigenous um, settlement in North America in the 19th century. The Dakota refuge, um, went, fled into Canada to seek to avoid what they called their final extinction. The Spokane in the 19, 1850s said troops came to wipe them out. The Lakota in the 1870s said soldiers think only of our death. There are place names in America called, translated as killed off the pea guns, where all were wiped out. So there is a discourse that is the consequence of genocide that is, is distinct. And that's what we're interested in, I think, right, Greg? And we're interested in the forms of resistance that go beyond the frontier, that go to the resistance of other forms of genocide and a continuing resistance that Greg spoke to, which is, you know, he is, his scholarship is framed around um, a, a response to a history of genocide. Now, I'll leave it there. And if, Greg, you wanted to add anything before we finish up. Time's, Time's up. Sorry. Sorry, Greg. Um, yeah, look, for me, as, as, I, as I touched on with my little show and tell, um, I think there's there's a there's a dual challenge there of confronting the t the um, the visual rhetoric um, that comes through Australia's Australia's um, uh, visual archive, and and trying to disentangle and um, and and bring into focus um, the, the 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 rhetoric that has become disguised. Um, there is a rhetoric of genocide in Australia, but it has become subsumed and disguised, and, I, and it's a fairly easy task of, that most people with experience in discourse analysis will be familiar with to, uh, to tackle that. So um, I'm looking forward to, to working with Ruby on, on this co-edited volume, and um, maybe there'll be one or two people in the room who might be interested in contributing as well. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay. Um, I just uh, draw attention to the um, uh, 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 what I say at the bottom there is that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are advised that the presentation contains images and names of people who are now deceased, and the presentation contains references to words, terms, and descriptions that may be culturally sensitive or considered inappropriate um, today. So, just want to. The, the words I'll be using are not my words in that sense. Um, now, uh, I, I'm enjoying this conference partly because I, I feel I know less about uh, the subject of Indigenous studies now than I did before I walked in the door, which I think is a good thing. I think it's good to have our ideas destabilised in, in that way. Um, now, to get going on things quickly, yeah, the, basically the history of Australian archaeology, the conventional view of it is that before 1956, uh, it was all just antiquarianism and also even worse, skull stealing and such. And also um, that there was no involvement of indigenous people in the subject. Um, uh, it was mentioned that I had a laureate project on the history of Pacific archaeology, and, and coming from this, um, there were obviously people who were involved in uh, archaeology in Australia who were also involved in the Pacific, and it became more and more clear to me that, that, that both of these propositions, um, that there wasn't any kind of, you know, useful or good archaeology being done before 1956, and also that there had been no involvement of Indigenous people, um, were... Uh, as I uh, wrote in an article that made me so unpopular with, uh, with Australian archaeologists, some of them anyway, I, uh, I left the country. Um, everything you've been told about the history of Australian archaeology is wrong. And I, the more research I do on this with Lynette and our research assistant, uh, Charlotte Wood, the more this becomes clearly the case. Um, now, uh, in saying that, I don't want to bag the founders of, of sort of modern archaeology uh, in Australia, people such as John Mulvaney, other elders of the university study of Australian archaeology, they had their reasons for the first contention. Uh, and that was that uh, basically 1957, the Murray Commission, which led to the massive expansion of Australian archaeology, uh, of, of Australian universities, uh, the archaeologists wanted to be part of this, uh, and they were extremely successful in that archaeology uh, started to be taught, indigenous Australian archaeology started to be taught in universities across the country. Um, so that was a good thing. It worked. Um, and the way that they did it was by drawing a strong contrast with previous practices of people who we might call archaeologists, uh, often they would have been museum people. Uh, in previous times. But the second proposition, that there was no involvement of Indigenous Australians, is simple blindness. People just didn't see uh, the absolutely critical involvement of Indigenous Australians in the development of the discipline. And it's this which I um, wish to talk about in this, uh, in this talk. Now, um, I, I, um, I asked uh, Lynette to participate in the project because I was very taken by a book that she did with uh, Penny Olson, Australia's First Naturalist, Indigenous People's Contribution to Early Zoology. Um, it came out in 2019. Also a book that she did uh, earlier with her partner um, Ian McNiven on uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples and the Colonial uh, um, Culture of Archaeology, which uh, is still, I think, uh, something... There's still a book that I think many archaeologists working in Australia might find uh, quite uncomfortable to read. Um, the point in Australia's First Naturalist was that, of course, um, you know, the names on all the books about uh, the zoology of Australia were all by um, uh, 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 white uh, colonialists or, or naturalists who were visiting from other countries. But in fact, the knowledge that Aboriginal people had, which they passed on to these um, uh, natural scientists was absolutely critical for uh, everybody's understanding. And uh, I think that uh, another point that um, particularly Lynette would like to uh, 
make is that we, the study that we're doing, which is part of an, it's an Australian Research Council study, uh, we see it as being decolonial rather than post-colonial. And I won't read out all those um, things, but uh, I suppose most simply put, I suppose being post-colonial would be giving an acknowledgement of country, uh, but decolonial might be giving the country back. So I'd say that would be the difference. And what we're seeking to do is give back a piece of hidden history uh, and or at least start the process of, of doing that. All right. OK, our initial areas of interest, um, and the one I'm going to concentrate on the short time that I have, is the construction of the entire megafauna debate, uh, which is uh, basically it's the idea, OK, there used to be giant marsupials in Australia. They aren't there anymore. Uh, what happened to them and when did it happen? One question is, was there an overlap between the existence of these uh, giant marsupials and the uh, presence of Australian uh, indigenous Australians uh, from 65,000 years ago or so? Uh, or was it the climate that did in these uh, giant animals? Now, this is a debate that's been going on essentially since the 1830s. And I think in any account of that debate, you will never see any mention at all that Aboriginal people might have been involved in the debate and setting the terms of this debate. Um, so that's the main thing I'm going to talk about. Um, the interpretation and names of unfamiliar artifact types. You know, where did these early antiquarians or archaeologists get uh, terms such as Piri points from, or Cod, Juyurka, and others? Also, who took them to the sites? In the first place, you know, they didn't just wander around the country randomly finding wonderful galleries of rock art. They were taken to them by Indigenous Australians. And also, um, and this is something I want to do a bit more uh, research on, detailed knowledge of the stages of stone tool production. Um, and archaeologists find stone tools all over the world, but they rarely encounter people who are able to expertly flake and nap stone tools, except in places such as Australia. Now, indigenous Australian knowledge of stone tool production as passed on to these early archaeologists is absolutely critical for a large part of our knowledge of the technology of stone using through the entire world. Uh, going back to our earliest ancestors millions of years ago, that knowledge that was passed on, how you actually make a stone tool, uh, has been absolutely critical. And again, it's a story. You won't see it in any book, um, but hopefully you will see it in some books there further on the time. Now, a lot of uh, people have picked up on the history of rock art studies, and there is a, a recent book, History of Australian Rock Art Research, which does give um, a, a, a proper recognition to Indigenous Australians. So we're not doing much on, on that field. But these are the areas of interest that we, that we uh, initially had. OK, this is, this is the example I want to give. In 1830, George Rankin discovered, in inverted commas, the megafauna, the giant extinct marsupials, in the Wellington Caves. And there was an account by Major Thomas Mitchell, but wrongly attributed to uh, the notorious J.D. Lang, um, that was published originally in the Sydney Gazette, a New South Wales advertiser. Um, and the point that Mitchell makes is, and he, he says this here, um, in the absence of such men as Professor Jameson, Professor Buckland, or Baron Cuvier, the Aborigines are a very good authority on this point, i.e. that these bones that Rankin is finding were not of animals which exist in the present, but which were of extinct animals. For when shown several of the bones and asked if they belong to any of the species at present inhabiting the territory, they uniformly replied, Bail that belong it to kangaroo, bail that belong it to emu. And this is New South Wales pigeon of the time for they're not from a kangaroo and they're not from an emu, implying certainty by using the negative bail. Now, that's interesting for several reasons. One is that 
they would expect the readers of the Sydney Gazette to understand uh, without any translation uh, New South Wales Pigeon, and that would certainly have not have been the case, I would think, uh, much after uh, 1830. But the point is that right at the time when much of the continent is unexplored by, uh, by Europeans, um, they're relying on Aboriginal knowledge to say that these extinct animals are in fact extinct animals and not just ones that you might find or they hadn't found them yet. Um, so right 1830 onwards. Um, then when we move on to Count Pavel Strzelecki's uh, so-called mastodon tooth, it was actually a diprotodon, a, uh, an extinct marsupial. And again, and there's many examples of this. So it says, the Australian fossil tooth here described was brought by a native to Count Strzelecki. Whilst that enterprising and accomplished traveller was exploring the ossiferous caves in Wellington Valley, the native stated that the fossil was taken out of a cave further in the interior than those of Wellington Valley, and which Count Strzelecki was deterred from exploring by the hostility of the tribe then in possession of the district. So there's... It's a kind of fairly important contribution, I would have thought. Also, I'm, I was interested that uh, in 1845, the Count published his physical description of New South Wales, where he called the concept of terra nullius a sophistry of law, and notes that indigenous Australians are, and I quote, as strongly attached to property and the rights which it involves as any European political body. So it's a, a quote worth conjuring with. Now, Let's move on to George Bennett, uh, an early naturalist. And this is where what comes into play are indigenous traditions that are interpreted by Europeans as being that in times in the past, indigenous Australians had coexisted with the megafauna and knew something about their behaviour, where they lived and such things. And again, this is quite critical because this is where the argument comes from that the extinct marsupials overlapped in time with indigenous Australians. And the information came from indigenous Australians who had stories about animals that were no longer around but which um, had been uh, in the past. And uh, this is a, a conversation with a, a, an indigenous man called called here Charlie Pierce, uh, and he describes some of the behavior of animals which certainly uh, George Bennett took to be reference to these extinct uh, marsupials. Right, another example, and I, I, I hope that uh, nothing that I'm mentioning here is, is, is um, culturally sensitive. Um, John Walter Gregory, who wrote, coined the term, I believe, the dead heart of Australia. And this very early 1900s expedition, uh, university uh, expedition, uh, to the area around Lake Eyre. And the entire expedition in search of the bones of extinct giant marsupials was based on indigenous traditions of the presence of beings uh, of some kind um, that certainly the Europeans interpreted as being extinct marsupials. And so this was a fairly major expedition predicated entirely on Aboriginal knowledge and derived entirely from Aboriginal knowledge. And the first chapter is called How the Kadimakara Came Down from the Skies. And it's the story of why the bones uh, were, uh, could be found around in the Lake Eyre district. And um, in the book are described the guides who take them to find these bones, and particularly this man, uh, Emil Kintalakandi. Um, and there's some wonderful uh, 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 quotations about this. Uh, Next day, all hands set to work searching the riverbed for fossil bones. Our guide, Emil, soon called me and after sundry theatrical attitudes exclaimed, Kenny Makara, and pulled out of the mud part of the lower jaw of a diprotodon, 
The result of the morning's work was a good collection of fossil bones of kangaroo, bandicoot, crocodile, mudfish, and birds. So, again, the whole collection and development of this debate, which is still a major debate in, in archaeology, about the extinction of the giant marsupials of Australia, as you can see again, entirely based on uh, um, the knowledge of, of indigenous Australians. Another aspect of this, Herbert Bassadow, in 1914, he adjudged that, uh, that the um, uh, uh, indigenous Australians had been in Australia for many thousands and thousands of years because he interpreted certain aspects of rock art, engraved rock art, as representing the tracks of extinct uh, 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 um, animals. In this case, uh, the, the, the Geniornis, the giant bird, the Geniornis. So, again, aspects of, of how long have indigenous people have been in Australia, and it's based on ideas about and derive from the knowledge of indigenous people. OK, megafaunal uh, 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 conclusions, in case we don't have time for, for any more. How long have I got? Just four minutes. Four minutes, OK. Um, major elements of what is a major debate in Australian archaeology, a debate that began in 1830. Uh, they were in place by 1914, and indigenous involvement was crucial in their formulation. The indigenous Australians recognised that the bones were of extinct species as recorded from the earliest European discovery of megafaunal bones in 1830 onwards and were involved in their identification as such. Indeed, it was indigenous Australians that guided the first explorers and scientists to the sites where such bones could be found. Indigenous stories that they had in the distant past encountered such animals were recorded during the 19th century, and from this came the idea that indigenous Australians had a role in the extinction of megafauna through hunting practices. At the same time, it was recognised that there was little or no evidence of a direct association between Aboriginal remains or artefacts and megafauna at sites, and still to this day is the case. We don't have megafaunal bones with spears sticking out of them or anything like that, so it's still an open question. Indigenous rock art by 1914 was also interpreted as including depictions of extinct megafauna or their tracks, further suggesting an overlap in time between humans and megafauna. And so, in a way, as I say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, uh, which uh, uh, one definition says is used to express resigned acknowledgement of the fundamental immutability of human nature and institutions, i.e. these debates are still going on today uh, and uh, uh, generally unrecognized. Now, a final thing I should say, the next step in the, the thing, we, we had a small ARC grant, 90% of it is for, is for uh, um, research assistance in trying to track down in old uh, um, journals and such examples of, of, uh, of indigenous involvement in archaeology. The next step is surely to contact the descendants of indigenous people whose names we do know from our studies or people with an association to particular sites, such as the Wellington Caves, to see what coalitions we may be able to form to get the word out about these early indigenous experts and scientists and their contribution to our knowledge of the history of Australia. So I said our grant has been taken up just documenting what evidence is out there. And I would really encourage younger scholars to take up the challenge, as I'm, I'm, uh, I find applying for ARC grants far too stressful and I'm not going to do it again in the future. Um, uh, there's, there's, a, there, there's many other uh, examples I could have given. Um, there's some very interesting examples of um, indigenous agency where uh, Avista intended removing a particular rock to Adelaide, whereupon the local blacks destroyed it. Uh, another case where the manager found uh, an artifact um, and uh, said the black fellow interposed, saying that if such a stone as that were taken to the house and any woman should see it, the blacks would die. He accordingly took it away and covered it in the sand where it had been found. Um, so there is evidence of very active involvement of Aboriginal people, either revealing or not revealing or taking away things that they did not want these early archaeologists to say. And uh, I made the point before I'm making it about Bassadow and our whole entire knowledge of experimental archaeology, of stone tool flaking, uh, I could go on. Um, 
Bassadao led to this man, Sir Francis Knowles, who was the acknowledged expert in the 1940s and 50s on experimental stone technology. So it goes from Bassadao, Knowles takes his knowledge, then the anthropologist Elk Elkin goes out to observe some very particular processes which Knowles did not understand in the flaking of stone tools. And so he went out uh, uh, with indigenous stone tool nappers. He was able then to convey that information, and then Knowles used it in his next edition of his book in 1953, which came out, I think that's the year he died. So the more you look into this, the more and more uh, evidence of, of, uh, of um, basically indigenous involvement, indigenous agency, and in the whole development of archaeology in Australia is there. And uh, I would just um, really encourage uh, our indigenous and non-indigenous archaeologists to really take account of this. It really is a, an important contribution which has gone almost entirely unrecognised to the present. Thank you very much. Uh, my heart's racing. Sorry. <laughs> I think I picked it up a bit from Shino. I feel um, incredibly privileged to be in a room with such a, a huge brain capacity. And so I am feeling very nervous. Um, but I'm also very honoured to be here. And I would like to start by uh, paying my profound respects to Uncle Chegg. Thank you so much for welcoming us here this morning to your country. Um, and I'm, I feel very privileged to be here on the Durabal um, Jagara, Jagara lands. And um, I will also pay my respects to Nyambri Nunawal um, country, uh, ancestors and custodians on custodians on whose land I'm privileged to live and work down in Canberra at the Australian National University. I do that as a Gurindji Malian Mutbara woman and the reason I've changed my um, presentation around today and let's hope I can... Nope. Yes. Um, please forgive the title at the bottom. Uh, when I was sitting here this morning um, listening to the distinguished speakers um, and I, I pay my respects to all First Nations speakers here and particularly visitors from uh, overseas, uh, I felt very strongly the presence of my father, Joe Croft, and um, he gave me a little push, a little prod. Uh, I think about that whenever I come up here to Mianjin um, my, my father went to University of Queensland back in the 1940s and uh, he was a member of the Stolen Generations. Um, he spent a lot of time in Queensland. He loved, he went to school up in Charters Towers. He came down to UQ in 1944, uh, spent a number of years here um, studying engineering I've come up this weekend because I really wanted to be part of um, this conference with some people who I have such huge respect for. And in a way, it's um, uh, paying tribute to distinguished Professor Eileen Morton Robinson who helped me along this path. I've never forgotten um, the masterclass that you gave in Indigenous Research Knowledges at University of South Australia 12 years ago now, which kind of um, pushed me on the path. So what I wanted to do was the, pro the title of the project I was going to be speaking about today um, is one that I'm, I'm extremely privileged to be able to uh, be leading with um, First Nations uh, um, participants and guides down in Canberra, but it actually came out of this project. So I thought I'll bring it back around because um, um, I certainly feel my dad here with me today. And uh, is Olivia here? When you were saying before things aren't written stone, for me it's kind of the opposite. So I'm, I'm starting with the korua, which is um, a Gurindji term for stone axe in my country, um, stone axe head. And this is my Venn diagram. This is the diagram. This is the object that I used as part of my uh, basis for what I was doing in my creative-led um, doctoral research project, which was framed in, uh, in methodologies of critical Indigenous performative and collaborative autoethnography and story work. Um, 
And I worked very closely with uh, my patrilineal community up home um, on our country uh, in um, uh, the Victoria River region, named after a, a distant monarch who never actually came over here. Um, but uh, that's been the guiding place for me. And, and this Korowa, I always say that um, it, I didn't find it, it found me uh, and country found me. So I've I come from a creative-led um, background. I'm, I multidisciplinary. What it, that means, I, I work as um, um, an artist, a curator, an educator, um, a lifelong student, and um, I'm in the centre of art history and art theory. But I'm not actually a, a trained art historian. Um, I came into the field as a as a practitioner. Uh, both my parents, my non-indigenous mum and my um, beloved father. Both my parents had a huge and profound impact on um, who I am today. And uh, I kind of marry all those mixed bits in who I am and what I do. And, and uh, for me, um, the tenant, the, one of the underlying reasons for being here is to want to understand more about critical Indigenous studies in the field of that and understand how I have been incorporating that into my own research practice, how I do that within my work with other First Nations students, because for that, that for me is a priority. Um, I felt really inspired hearing about the importance of faculty and building those faculty and how do we build those numbers so that we have control over the kinds of things that we're doing and not having to go with the begging cup all the time to us to do projects. And I've been really inspired by all the um, presentations here today as well, which have sparked um, thoughts for me. So I'm going to, because I come from a creative-led background, I've got lots of images, and I'll try and go, go through them. Um, and please pull me up on the 20 minutes, whoever's doing the, the time. Great. This is, I, I use this as a, a bit of a, um, oh, clearly an ironical position. It's from 1912. It's a white Australian male um, academic. He's an Australian, he's an Australian native standpoint. And I want to flip that and I pay respect to um, Professor Morton Robinson with um, talking about standpoint theory and how we see who we are and our positionality in the world. Uh, I am at the product of these two people, but not just to these two people, all those ancestors who went before me. And they, I'm standing up here on their shoulders very much. Uh, Dad was um, born on country, um, went back home in the late 18, sorry, 1980s. Um, his white father, my grandfather, was actually born in the 1800s, in 1869 in Victoria, ended up in Queensland. Then he went over to the Northern Territory um, in the early 1910s, which is where he met my grandmother. My father's buried uh, on our country. My brother and I took him back home after he passed away. I've been really fortunate to be able to make that um, journey home and lots of people I know who have that history of displacement haven't had the same uh, capacity to do that. I've been able to do it and build that into my, my life's work. Um, and for me, this doctoral research project was not simply a, a finite period of start and finish. It's an ongoing um, process. It's a continual process. And relationality um, underpins everything that I do. And th the idea of co collaboration, collaborative autoethnography, was very much about working with community in a way that research I'm doing could be owned um, and used by them as well. Um, going back through, I've, I've mined um, public and, and personal archives been, and been working in those for a number of decades now. The irony is the accessing of archives literally act, actually destroys them. So I find I'm looking through these old police letter books. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, one of the earliest references to my father from 1927 in a police letter book from Timber Creek. And as I turn the pages, they are literally disintegrating in my hands. And so it's almost as if there's this that idea of temporality. Um, I'm coming into them as a, a time traveller, but I'm also destroying what is there. And so how to kind of uh, make records of these documents. In fact, th this one is held in the um, uh, 
Northern Territory Archives Service, which is part of the National Archives of Australia. And I first accessed it in 2014, and I don't think it had been opened um, since they had been uh, put in there. And um, I, ha I went back late last year on a, a research um, period of five months up there and asked to access them again, and they're now off limits. But because I had built a relationship with the archivists, they let me have them, and I could see why it's so destructive to now use access these um, documents, but they're not digitally scanned or anything. And I feel um, a real responsibility when I'm going through these archives, coming across other people's names of community that I know, um, are documenting what I can for other people as well. I use this in a, um, uh, an artwork that I hope we'll, we'll get a chance to have a, a look at in a minute. Um, and I had to redact the names at the direction of the Northern Territory Department of Fire um, police and emergency services. I had to redact the names that didn't relate to my own family. Um, I've been accessing archives all over the country. These are from the South Australian Museum. Uh, they're of my grandmother in... Um, and I should have said previously there's images of people who are deceased, um, but I have permission from community to be able to include those um, images. Um, my grandmother in... Uh, the records of Tyndale, um, a doctor colleague, a, a student, a medical student who was doing his PhD research on um, uh, diseases in First Nations communities, had First Nations uh, people at various places such as Carlin Compound and other Aboriginal reserves around the Territory put at his disposal for his research and my grandmother was one of them. And the reason I found that out was I would type her name into uh, the search engines and see what would come up. and. Uh, a link came up at one point in 2014 that there was photographs of her from 1934 in these uh, archives in the South Australian Museum. I was so excited to see them uh, until that the, the uh, people working in the family history unit down there informed me that these were part of medical research records. And so I've been going back through this um, student's records. He published this under his own um, uh, jurisprudence through Cambridge Press in the UK in 1936 and he was using her as a, a topic for study for um, the uh, impact of yours and other diseases in uh, Aboriginal communities. So um, I had wanted to see my grandmother and see what she looked like and to have sections of her uh, dissected and delivered up through the computer was really confronting. It's the violence of the archives that are ongoing. Um, I use photographs. I work a lot in photo media. Um, I co collect terms, terminology. Um, the references here are from uh, uh, documents in Trove that um, re uh, record my father being um, awarded a bursary, a Commonwealth bursary, to come to UQ in 1944, and it made national headlines at the time because it was so unusual. Um, he was called everything from uh, you know native, abo, half caste, half blood, mixed blood, through to brilliant scholar all these kinds of signifiers and uh, things that we've had to continually deal with. These are not self-portraits, they're more like a mirror back to my father. Um, and images that I use in works um, of family are about also reclaiming that place um, and space. Working with um, community up home uh, on country, I was able to be part of a, um, a history project, a uh, Gurindji history project called Yijani True Stories from Gurindji Country, working with elders from community, rain, young rangers, um, some really dear linguist colleagues from UQ who I'm still working with on projects, um, Professor Felicity Meekins, Erica Chirola who is based in community up there, um, and working with immediate families such as aunts, nieces um, and really significant elders, many of whom have since passed away, travelling around to sites on country, um, important sites that I would never be able to go to by myself. And so that's that for me is the idea of collaboration. I don't want to be out there by myself anyway. Um, I don't have that kind of access um, and nor do I seek it. Um, I'd much rather be there as uh, someone who can kind of contribute to an overall project. We worked a lot with um, young people on community as well. And one of the things that we did was, um, uh, one of the things I did for my PhD was to walk uh, the Wave Hill walk-off track, which is a 22 kilometre track 
in um, community which is uh, on the National Heritage uh, Register. It went on to the National Heritage Register in 2007, the same year that the NT intervention, emergency response, was brought down. So we had this kind of tension that operates in terms of we, we venerate places and we venerate the past, but we don't um, we certainly don't venerate the people who are associated with those places. I wanted to get a sense of, um, of, of that country, so I walked it with um, the assistance of uh, cousins, nephews, um, and over a period uh, of months and years, so it wasn't all under one um, uh, particular time frame, but to understand also a little bit more about a place that's in the national psyche, but as this romanticised, unknowable place, um, and what does it actually mean in terms of uh, place and location and, um, and sovereignty for peoples now, who are still under the NT intervention some 15, 16 years later. I'm going to whiz through these because I want to show you some of the exhibition images. Uh, we worked through um, the Karankani Art and Culture Centre and art and culture is a really important part of that organisation. It's one of the youngest art centres in the Northern Territory. It's in the old power station at Wave Hill. It got completely flooded um, well, Dagaragu and, and Kalkaringi got completely obliterated with the floods in the earlier part of this year and everyone was um, uh, evacuated up to Darwin, outside of Darwin, for a few months. They've gone back since then, but nobody had ever seen the water come up in that way that fast. It, it caught everyone unawares. People had to be helicoptered and rescued off um, uh, rooftops. Um, it, it's interesting. I talked to my cousin recently and he said, oh, it cleaned it. It just cleaned everything out. It kind of took all this rubbish away with it as well. Community, uh, sorry, artists at the, at the art centre documented um, a, through a series of history paintings, which went back way before the walk-off, um, back to the very first impact of um, the pastoral industry into the region in the late 1880s. 1883 was when Wave Hill Station was established. So there's been 130 so years of um, impact up there on that country. Um, the community it became kind of the byword for the birth of the National Land Rights Movement in this country, but it's still a place that's um, kind of unknowable to people um, if they haven't been there. And even if you have been there, I'm, I'm very well aware that um, it's a, one of the homes that I carry in me. I'm just going to get to the exhibition images here. We did a series of artist camps, um, um, went to some of the other surrounding communities, um, working with people who had been part of that walk-off as well. Um, it was such a privilege and an honour working with all of the people who are featured here. This is the cover of the uh, Yijani history book that came out of that um, particular project. Another book that came out of that was Songs from the Stations, Wadjara. So working with women to record a lot of the women's and uh, young girls' songs down there. Working with um, family members, immediate family members who'd been displaced and removed to Carlin Compound and other government institutions. Tracking down my grandfather, that was his gravesite um, previously. Going to places like the old leprosarium where my grand my aunt had been one of the longest internees there um, from the 1930s through to 1983 uh, in, when it moved to its new site as well. Sites of places such as Reddit Dixon Children's Home. And it's the people who carry the stories. Um, and when I see so many of these people here now who are no longer with us, their legacy is within the exhibition that was curated as part of this. It spent five years touring around Australia and next year it will go to the Australian Embassy in Washington. We also worked closely with non-Indigenous supporters who'd been part of um, the walk-off support in um, the 1960s and 70s. Uh, people um, from community, displaced community and community on country were also essential to events that surrounded um, the exhibition at different venues. This is a site, this gives you a sense of that amazing um, Korowa stone axe 
and if you put it in your hands, you could feel the hand of the maker in it. It fitted perfectly into your palm and in a way it also became a time machine for me when I was holding it. I have caretakership of it at the moment. It will go back to the Arts Centre when it finishes its... Um, tour in, overseas we're not sure how we'll tour it where and I'm going to finish on that slide which is my dad and my brother um, who passed away um, when he just after he'd been at Harvard and I feel that sense of going to Harvard 30 years after he's been there and a street's named after them in Canberra on Yambri and Unawal country because of their contribution to Indigenous education so I'll, I'll finish there thanks very much. Zani Wawu Hoipa Kombra, Ia Doa Kipshe Kombra, the Zani Wiek Shia. That's a, a greeting in the uh, Wajaje Ia, Wajaje Ia, or the Osage language, Osage talk. After hearing uh, Uncle Chegg this morning uh, welcome us here, I wanted to start with that language as a response. Uh, and one of, the, one of the words and concepts in that Osage greeting is, uh, has, has the uh, the word wahoi, and uh, wahoi is very hard to translate, and people spend a long time trying to understand it. It's one of these concepts in our language where people spend, you get a different understanding across your life of what it means, but it, it is that word that brings us into a space and allows us, whoever we are together, to, to talk, you know, to communicate. Uh, and and to signal to people, we're, we're we're gathering here to share ideas. We're not fighting, you know. We're not. We might argue, but we're not. We're not fighting. This isn't negotiations trying to end a conflict. Uh, we're, we're 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 here in this space, recognizing that that we're here together. And um, uh, hearing that welcome this morning, I I. I I hadn't planned to say anything about Wahoy, but I felt very much that sense that that's how I was being welcomed here and wanted to acknowledge that and the people of this land by, by saying that, to say a, a sincere way we na, which is sort of a way of saying thank you in Osage, but it's different than that, of course, but uh, thank you for, for hosting me. Appreciate it. In 1997, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, a Dakota scholar and novelist, asserted that the purpose of this field that most of us now call indigenous studies is, quote, doing the intellectual work of the tribal nations, doing the intellectual work of the tribal nations. As many of you know, the diction of tribal nations is particular to the United States, where the nomenclature of tribe as a designation for indigenous peoples is still common, in certain ways problematic, archaic, uh, but what people recognize. But I'm guessing most of you can follow Cookland's meaning, especially if you replace tribal nations with simply nations or first nations, iwi, pueblos, or whatever other terms you might be familiar with. Cookland, co-founder of Wichazo Saw Review, a journal focused on the development of Native American studies as an academic discipline, made this assertion in an essay she titled, Who Stole Native American Studies? in 1997, which remains widely taught, widely read, taught, and cited. The essay is one of many that established Cook Lynn as a formidable proponent of indigenous studies as not only a legitimate academic enterprise, but as a force for bringing scholarly resources to bear in building a future for indigenous peoples and communities. She was in those days when my generation of scholars was just starting to feel our way toward comprehending what we were getting ourselves into as indigenous scholars in the academy. Rhetorically fierce in her writing and at a podium. Those who got to know her on a more personal level found her to also be delightful, engaging, wise, and funny as a veteran thought leader, and always unafraid of speaking truth in public or private. Cookland has considered Native studies to have it as it, at its core what she has called a radical conscience that served to remind those who practiced it of the stakes of our work. Today I begin with Cookland's assertion of indigenous studies as doing the work of the tribal nations in hopes of encouraging the sorts of courageous conversations about indigenous studies that the organizers of this gathering envisioned in bringing us together. 
Along with hoping to emulate Cooklin's willingness to say what she thought needed to be said, I also want to push back against her formulation, or at least offer a critical reading of what I see as missing in Cooklin's analysis. As a way of engaging in the sort of conversation, I see us as called to have not just with each other, but also with those like Cooklin, who, though retired, can and should be contributing to our work through essays and articles like Who Stole Native American Studies? Thus, today, I'll frame my remarks through Cooklin's influential essay, then revisit some of the historical arc she lays claim to in narrating the emergence of Native American studies. Doing so establishes what I see as a fundamental need in indigenous studies, which is twofold. One, more attention to the imbrication of our field in the political economy of academia, which I will argue is not primarily a matter of understanding academic structures in order to plot a path by which we can escape those structures or subvert them, but rather makes us more immediately aware of what our context, our academic context means while we are doing the intellectual work that we're doing. And two, given the limits of academia, which I find considerable, how do we define the intellectual work Cooklin puts at the center of indigenous studies in ways that help us imagine that important work being done? I'm drawing these remarks from the introduction to a book I'm working to complete, the working title of which, Academic Crisis slash Indigenous Critique, is the same as my title for today's talk. And I really want to thank the organizers for helping me take 128 pages of introduction, which is almost book length, and uh, trying to figure out exactly what am I trying to say here. And I think I've gotten further along in that process, so I really appreciate the opportunity. The introduction sets out a context in which to understand four moments of academic crisis I was involved in between 2009 and 2015 while I was director of the American Indian Studies program at the University of Illinois and while I was president of and in other leadership positions in the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, or NASA, I'm going to call it today. Those four crisis moments are the vandalization of a 2009 on-campus public art exhibit at the University of Illinois, the controversy and calls for boycott that arose over NASA's 2010 annual meeting in Tucson in the wake of Arizona's governor signing draconian anti-immigration laws weeks before our meeting, the termination of the appointment of Professor Stephen Salida to our American Indian Studies faculty by the administration of the University of Illinois in August 2014. They took away his job the week before he was getting in a car to move to our university and the controversy that erupted publicly in 2015 over substantial allegations that I believe are true, calling into question the claims of Cherokee identity by prominent Native Studies um, scholar Andrea Smith. Each of my chapters points to an urgent need for precise and rigorous analysis of the academic context of Indigenous Studies that recognizes in summary if I get this right. First, indigenous critique not only informs, but in fact indelibly formed what I think of and what I define as indigenous studies. And I want to argue remains an animating and constitutive part of the core of what indigenous studies should be. Now, I remember this term being around forever, by the way. I don't know who coined it, but I remember it being around forever. It's not a new one, although it seems to be picking up popularity in, in certain ways. But indigenous critique has certainly been how it's been referred to for a long time. It shows up actually in Jody Bird's title to her book, The Transit of Empire, um, where she talks about indigenous critiques of colonialism, for instance. And these are, short, these are shortened little summary points of, of much longer arguments. Um, uh, I don't have time to, to take on. Critical mass brings and has brought indigenous critique to the fore in academia. When you get enough people around doing the same thing, talking to each other about them, it tends to make other things happen in a way that, it, that doesn't happen when you're alone. Uh, but it's been present in various ways in the academic world for centuries, literally. We can see it, for instance, in the example, example of uh, Caleb Chishatamuk, sorry, 
the Wampanoag man who graduated from Harvard in 1666. His uh, classmate was scheduled to also graduate and died beforehand. And then within a year, uh, um, Chishatamuk died as well. Three, in a, in a related way, indigenous critique has sometimes made its way into academic discourse at a remove through indigenous and non-indigenous scholars, including anthropologists, historians, and those who study law and policy. Many scholars from these fields, it's also important to point out, as Professor Kalashaw noted this morning, have been committed to keeping that critique out of academic discourse. Four, indigenous critique is also formative in the development of what I call the indigenous intellectual project, which is not academic, even though one can find it in very various ways, not just in indigenous studies, but in other parts of the institutional structure of colleges, universities, academies, uh, like our co-host, the Australian Academy for the Humanities, scholarly associations and societies, student support units, and more. If you're going to get indigenous people together, you're almost always going to get critique coming along with them. Some people call it our baggage. Others of us say it's just who we are. Five. Yeah. In spite of their many overlaps, indigenous studies, indigenous critique, and the indigenous intellectual project are not, to my mind, the same thing. And differentiating between them is vital to reconceptualizing and redefining our work. Now, this may be particular to the US context, which may be different, but I think there are concepts within this that are important to think about in any discussion of how we define, redefine, reconceptualize indigenous studies. So that last point is where I'm headed today, which brings me back to Cook Lynn's question. Who stole Native American studies? In her 1997 essay, Cook Lane argues that, quote, a major reason for the development of Native American studies as a disciplinary, as a disciplinary work was to defend indigenous nationhood in America. That's why we do this. We're not trying to take, in fact, what somebody was doing on indigenous topics five years before and say, oh, that's what we're doing here in the academy? Well, let me do that with you, and then we'll see what we can do to make it more this or that. It actually just kind of starts there, usually, with people. Uh, the, indig the indigenous studies that I think of as indigenous studies. She goes on to write, quote, the discipline was defined in general terms as the endogenous consideration of American Indians let me see it, uh, uh, of American Indians, or more specifically, the endogenous study of First Nations cultures and history. This meant that this discipline would differentiate itself from other disciplines in two important ways. It would emerge from within Native people's enclaves and geographies, languages, and experiences, and it would refute the exogenous seeking of truth through isolation, i.e. the ivory tower that has been the general principle of the disciplines most recently in charge of indigenous study. That is, history, anthropology, and related disciplines, all captivated by the scientific method of objectivity. For Cook Lynn, then, a major focus of Native American studies was to establish autonomous disciplinary units, departments, programs, and associations, for instance, through which indigenous studies as a discipline could take shape. As she writes of those who established the earliest programs, what they argued for, quote, what they argued for was a seat at the table, not only a seat at the table from which they had been excluded for 400 years, nor a seat as informant, but a primary seat as transformationists within the bounds of scholarship. They argued for that seat on the basis that white racism and cultural imperialism fostered in the major institutions of this country and in the orthodox, orthodox disciplines as well as in the established canons and epistemologies that those have been responsible for disfiguring and deforming Native peoples, communities, and nations." End quote. For Cook Lynn, this was part of, quote, a modern day intellectual quest for tribal nation autonomy, end quote. For the past 50 years, these two things, the academic world and indigenous intellectual life, have become increasingly intertwined. 
Starting in the 1950s, Native American students in the U.S became an important force in national Native politics. And by the end of the decade, the number of Native Americans in higher education was clearly and quickly growing. Along with that growth came the sorts of programs campus administrators were creating for other underrepresented groups, including student services, to help Native students succeed at college life. Students on many of those campuses sought more than a helpful, supportive environment outside of their classes, seeking as well to have courses relevant to their lives as Native people and faculty to teach those courses to whom they could relate. That never stopped people from taking classes, but that didn't also take away from the actual demand that people said, why don't we have any indigenous people on this faculty to teach us these things, right? That's one of the things that got that to change. Sometimes the people, their form of protest against that was going to graduate school, becoming a scholar, right? Um, but oftentimes there were scholars who could have taken those jobs. In the late 1960s, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which was almost exclusively concerned with reservation-based persons, knew of only 4,300 students who were enrolled in college. That, that, uh, that number, oh, and 50 years later, so 4,300 students enrolled in college in 1968, 50 years later, over 120,000 American Indians were enrolled in college. So that was 2018, right? That later number includes Native students wherever they reside, so the numbers are not strictly comparable, but may have been double or maybe even a little bit more. Maybe it was 10,000 students instead of 4,800. But that's still a growth of a lot, 120 times more. It seems fair to assume that Native enrollment uh, has increased a lot over those early numbers from over the past half century. Related trends have emerged in other places in the indigenous world. We don't want to suggest that any, in any way that the U.S. led any of this. I mean, it, things happen where they happen. And, and uh, I thought a lot about this, having helped start an international indigenous studies organization about how, how many ways in which bring people together in a room and then people start looking for the originary point. Who did this first? Who did that first? And that always seems to me to be a very Western style way of thinking about things. So I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying these are the numbers that I know them in the US. So uh, these emerge in other places too. S related trends at that moment or not another moment. Uh, I don't want to fetishize chronology because I don't think it always tells us as much as people think it does. But this was especially true in the Anglophone, uh, in, in Anglophone world, including Canada, Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Australia, four countries who initially wouldn't support the, the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. As those numbers have grown, so have the number of programs focused on meeting the needs of Native students on campus. Some colleges have Native student organizations that predate this era of growth, but the vast majority of such programs have started since 1968. Most of these programs have developed as part of the student service sector of colleges and universities. During the same half century, academic programs focused on curriculum and research centered on Native issues have arisen as well, usually in schools of education, colleges of education. In many ways, the crises I'm writing about an academic crisis, indigenous critique, were precipitated by the limits, constraints, and constraints of the academic world. It's stifling bureaucracies, fixation on compliance, commitment to disciplining knowledge and those who seek it, and of course, the enduring racism that's present within these institutions, or at least at least we've been, these problems have been exacerbated by these factors. These limits and constraints are what, for Cook Lynn, stole Native American studies. Indigenous critique, I want to suggest, provides the means of stealing Indigenous studies back, or better yet, I would say, to liberate Indigenous studies from its entangled place within academia. 
Who stole Native American studies continues to be an important question, but only insofar as it focuses on what happened after that moment in which Native studies emerged in the academy, drawing into its orbit the long history of indigenous intellectual responses to modernity. One way to think about what happened at that moment is to imagine two streams coming together, and these are streams that, that uh, Sue Hill's canoes tomorrow can travel on if she decides she wants to navigate any of them. One stream is the scholarly work focused on Native Americans and other indigenous peoples that had been going on within the academy for centuries, including plenty of important, this is in 1968, 1973, 1980, 1990, including plenty of important and sometimes impressive, often ill-conceived examples of scholarship focused on making the lives of indigenous people better. With just a few exceptions, non-indigenous scholars were the scholars who were swimming in that particular stream. The other stream had also existed for centuries, but had never found a home within institutions of any sort, really, including ones of higher education. This stream is what I call the indigenous intellectual project, a description that for me focuses on indigenous people using the power of the intellect to grapple with the challenges and problems of living as subjects of modernity, that is, the ongoing epoch and world made during, made during it through the ideologies and machinations of capitalism, especially colonialism, imperialism, slavery, genocide, and its multiple forms of gender oppression. This is not, I should point out, a denial of the rich depth of indigenous intellectual life before modernity, but instead a way of recognizing and distinguishing modes of intellectual engagement that arose specifically alongside modernity's fundamental challenges to indigenous survival. The wreckage of modernity, in other words, prompted a body of intellectual work that represents how indigenous peoples responded to the devastating impact of, colonial, of colonization. Indeed, I would say that modernity, colonization, dispossession, and capitalism produced and co-constituted our various peoples as indigenous. The category that we now occupy came out of modernity. And indigenous studies, starting with modernity then, seems to me appropriate. I could talk about Wajaje or Osage intellectual history that predates that, um, or, or other examples. Uh, but in some ways, having indigenous there as something that didn't exist before modernity for us or for other people, that indigenizing indigenous people can also be compared to, I'm not equating it with, the racialization of peoples. The indigenous intellectual project then has a central mode of critique of indigeneity, the critique of indigeneity, to borrow a formulation from Vicente Diaz. In order to obviate why this framing of the history of indigenous intellectual work is pivotal to how I'm approaching the analysis of the academic crises that I've experienced and that happen all too often. I'll make a couple of observations. First, higher education does not subsume that project, that intellectual project. The indigenous intellectual project showed up on campus. That didn't mean that suddenly higher education owned it, could subsume it. The whole project didn't show up on campus, in fact. It continues. In, in the many, many of the forms and venues as it existed in before, including newspapers and other publications, music, performance, and visual art. Further, forms of intellectual work not as easily defined by their relation to the challenges of modernity, including indigenous medicine and ceremony, have also continued. I think it's fair to say, though, that the academy has become more and more central to indigenous intellectual life over the half century since colleges and universities became loci for indigenous intellectual work. From my view within academia, that drift has happened as if, sometimes as if academia is an obvious, necessary, and natural home for the indigenous intellectual project that survived by other means for centuries, long before native and indigenous studies came along barely 50 years ago. This drift, I should say, is not an accident, but is part of that dynamic Brendan brought up earlier today, which is the way academic institutions instantiate the tendency in Western forms of knowledge to control and otherwise police knowledge. 
Perhaps the most basic of my questions is, what does it mean that the intellectual project I've described became part of the academic world? How did that transition change the character of the intellectual project? This is not to suggest that indigenous intellectual life becoming part of the academic world was a mistake or that people were part of the transition, that they should have done something different than they did. To go back to Cook Lynn's essay, I find myself asking a different question than who stole Native American studies. Instead, I want to ask something less pithy, which is what happened to the modern indigenous intellectual project when some of its practitioners, or better put, some of them, well, when, when some of its practitioners became college professors? The most obvious answer is that academic life has co-opted that intellectual project, blurring its vocational boundaries in profound ways. And I don't want to take away from the truth of that, which is usually the case at some level, that there's co-optation that goes along by participating in institutions like the ones that so many of us have degrees from, right? My concern is not so much to question, though, whether or not indigenous scholars and writers did the right thing or not by making academia a primary site for indigenous intellectual work. First of all, it's important to remember that the push for Native studies came about in large part because of the growing number of indigenous students on campuses. Those students have sought out courses focused on Native histories and experiences, programming that helped them make sense of their indigenous futures, and Native staff and faculty to work with them on campus. So the shift towards academia is obvious. Further, that shift was not exclusive to indigenous thinkers and scholars or even to other scholars of color. As various writers have demonstrated, the shift of intellectuals into university life had happened over much of the course of the 20th century. Rather, I want to argue that those of us who now find ourselves wrapped up in the dynamics that shifted 50 years ago need to think deeper and differently about the stakes of that shift. In doing so, I'm following Métis scholar and academic administrator extraordinaire Chris Anderson, who cites Cook Lynn as one of the few indigenous studies scholars to take note of the focus and the centrality of institutional structures um, in understanding higher education. As Anderson argues, quote, I think this is the next slide I have. Critical indigenous studies is a field, if not a discipline, in which scholars spend far too much of their time theorizing the prescriptions of its scholarship and far too little on institutional dynamics. Institutional positioning is every bit as crucial to legitimizing our discipline as the scholarship we produce." End quote. This leads, Anderson writes, uh, to a situation in which, quote, we have theorized much more intensely about which intellectual goals to aspire to than about the dynamics of our continued institutional marginalization. So Anderson's analysis is a trenchant reminder that universities do not operate like shopping malls or all-you-can-eat buffet restaurants in spite of the ever-increasing attention among academic leaders to treat courses in something like that way as products to be marketed and sold with success defined by revenue generation and other deliverables like efficiency. We can't just decide that indigenous studies will include what we want it to. We have to eat, in other words, some version of what's on the menu. This setup, in point of fact, works sufficiently well for many indigenous college students who are seeking to learn something that might bring benefit to their own and other indigenous communities. By which I want to point out a lot of students, the last thing they would ever want, a lot of indigenous students, is a degree in indigenous studies. I mean, that's not their dream. It's not what they came to college to do. They want to be an engineer. They want to be an ornithologist. They want to be something else. They want to be a teacher. There's lots of things they may want to know. Indigenous studies is usually not one of them. Some of them, it is true. That's what they want, and they don't know it yet. And so that's why we're there in certain ways for them in teaching. One of the reasons why we're there, one of the things that we do. We cannot escape a basic truth, however, which is that these institutions of higher education are now set up in a way that makes them conducive to the strategy of picking and choosing what to learn and what not to learn or what knowledge to keep and what to leave behind. So having to eat off the menu is problematic in and of itself, but it doesn't take away the fact that you have to eat off the menu. This is not only true for those majoring in traditional subjects, those indigenous students who want to major in traditional subjects like engineering, history, biology, English, or business. 
but also for those seeking a degree in indigenous studies or creative writing. Before becoming a program or department and offering courses, uh, before you get your minor or major approved or your certificate approved, an academic unit that proposes those things goes through processes of submission. Those processes range from straightforward consideration by a small committee to elaborate multi-stage ones involving multiple committees, followed by approvals, deans, provosts, chancellors, or presidents, and eventually usually a board of trustees signing up on everything. Anderson's reading of Who Stole Native American Studies and Cookland's other essays proceeds from an appreciation of something many who cite them fail to notice. People love who stole Native American studies, that sort of in-your-faceness of that statement. It's part of what Liz has always been so great at, uh, at doing. But what Chris notices is that Cookland insists that much of the basic work of indigenous studies is legitimizing itself within academia through striving for what might seem like rather mundane objectives, like the attainment of departmental status or building an autonomous curriculum. For Anderson, either we endeavor to make indigenous studies a legitimate part of the institutions in which we do our work or accept our marginalized status as somehow workable. And I think this is maybe Chris's most important point. Marginalization is easy to romanticize or fetishize. And sometimes when you keep fighting but losing the good fight, camaraderie and commiseration on the margins are important sources of consolation. Taking up permanent residence on the margins, on the other hand, is a capitulation to powerlessness that Anderson is not willing to accept, primarily because doing so makes our place within the institution not just weak, but as such vulnerable. Conceiving of indigenous academia as one intellectual stream in a broader indigenous intellectual world and longer indigenous, indigenous intellectual history in this regard helps me in two ways. First, it makes it possible to disentangle these things from each other. So I'm playing a game in academia to get my proposal funded, to get my major. It doesn't make it any less important that there's a game involved. That may be the thing that keeps something going that's important to keep going. There are important questions that are answered through the process. So it's more, in fact, than a game. And indigenous studies, uh, to disentangle indigenous academia in general and indigenous studies in particular from indigenous intellectual work more broadly. In my experience, indigenous studies units will almost always reflect local campus conditions. And this is one of the things I think that some of the broadest conversations of indigenous studies fail to really discuss is how much those local situations in fact dictate what we do because that's how it should be in certain ways. Um, but it doesn't mean that because it's happening at uh, UQ that it should be happening down the road somewhere else because it's a different place. Um, at the University of Oklahoma where I worked before Illinois, we had 39 US-based federally recognized indigenous peoples within the state the university serves. Illinois, which had a brutal history of indigenous removal and dispossession, had no indigenous peoples living as peoples anywhere in the state. So our program at Illinois did not let itself off the hook because of that history. We maintained relationships with the Peoria people who, were, who are now in Oklahoma and others who now persist as indigenous peoples and also with various urban native organizations in Chicago. But we did not have a present indigenous, historical indigenous community nearby. We were the indigenous community where we were. And that made things different than they were in Oklahoma, where we were surrounded. 1,600 Native American students on our campus. Second, it offers opportunities to think of more realistically about how, when, and why academia is connected to or not connected to indigenous communities, rather than fetishizing that discussion, which often happens, I think. On some campuses, an indigenous studies unit might have to be all things to all people, called on to represent indigenous pre presence in all cases being the only unit paying attention to the needs of students and helping out with admissions, retention, and inevitability and inevitably controversies. 
In other cases, an indigenous studies unit might be one of several or many units on campus that represent that indigenous presence. What I'm pointing to in saying that is different from saying we need more, more indigenous scholars, more indigenous leaders, more indigenous students, more pathways to academia from places indigenous people live. All of those things are still true. But the challenge we face in indigenous studies is thinking more deliberately and intentionally about some of the basic assumptions we operationalize in proliferating indigenous studies and other indigenous programs in academic institutions. What motivates me in disentangling, this process of disentangling is a reckoning for me that has been more important than figuring out how to fix university and college programs for indigenous students and indigenous studies or than figuring out whether or not such programs and institutions in which they exist can be or are worth the troubles to support. That reckoning involves coming to terms with the ongoing necessity of higher education in the, indig in the indigenous world while also honestly appraising what the indigenous world stands to gain from supporting colleges and universities is important to our future. Colonialism is an ideology and the colonial structures they proliferate have their own tendencies, one of which is to avoid or ignore dissent especially when that dissent threatens structures of power. I often find my research writing and other intellectual work gravitating to that sort of dissent and wanting to actually participate in it. How does that sort of agenda fit or not into the various models we have used or are formulating in settings like this one? Whatever agenda we adopt, I want to suggest that the severe limits that colleges, universities, and the systems of which they're a part, they cannot provide the running room some of us need to achieve our intellectual goals. Thus, the purpose of the disentanglement of advocating is not primarily to be tidy, getting things in their proper places, using the right tools for the right jobs. Instead, what's driven my academic research has been carving out a space in which to focus on the experiences of those on the margins of indigenous communities, which often requires being critical of the formal and informal institutions at the center, not of higher education institutions, but of indigenous communities themselves. And oftentimes those same institutions within indigenous communities are the ones we're going to to find somebody to, to participate in our programs, to tell us what's going on with federal policy now from your point of view. So rather than trying to solve this problem in institutions that cannot sustain the necessary solutions, I'm suggesting that we liberate ourselves from the need to have indigenous studies be all things and to solve all problems. Sometimes we can find other people in the institution itself. I was talking to Bronwyn about this last night. You know, sometimes indigenous studies people become the ones who are trying to arbitrate everything within the institution when there might be somebody better placed to do some of that work. So all of this is to say that indigenous people, this is almost the very end, Indigenous peoples have long held critical views towards higher education and the academic world, even as we've recognized its importance. Native studies has sub subsequently benefited from knowledgeable and wise people from indigenous communities, almost never expecting campus-based indigenous student and academic programs to teach people how to be indigenous. This is actually a complaint that people in our communities often have. What are you trying to teach these students how to be indigenous for? Indeed, consistently across campus-based indigenous programs, the idea that our function is to teach culture as opposed to teaching about maybe culture, maybe history, but other things, policy, is widely rejected. But sometimes we get in our minds that we want to be fugitives. And I can see the attraction of that. I like being a fugitive. Being a fugitive is cool. Flying below the radar can be exhilarating, especially when it brings with it success. We did plenty of this sort of hiding in plain sight in our programming at Illinois, choosing subtlety over a bullhorn when possible. And I often thought our program, with its reputation built very quickly on a campus defined through a big controversy over a racist mascot, is not amenable to the sort of work we did, is having a certain fugitive quality about it. But I always try to keep in mind that my academic version of fugitivity will never be as courageous as the work that's going on today as we speak among many people fighting to make our communities reflect the best of who and what we are as indigenous peoples. So does that mean I'm advocating capitulation, two more paragraphs, capitulation to the norms and procedures of settler colonialism, leaving the university to its own devices? Perhaps, but never always. And when I do, my rationale almost always comes back 
to what I find is a compellingly honest analysis of the situation at hand as a primary step toward figuring out the best way forward. What I refuse to do, however, is to allow the tendency in Western forms of knowledge institutionalized in academia to subsume and assimilate whatever shows up within its purview, to be the only or even primary context of my intellectual work. When I'm in academia, I must of necessity account for its demands. But I don't always have to be in academia. Returning to Cookland's argument that indigenous studies is doing the intellectual work of the tribal nations or indigenous peoples or communities, I want to say that we as scholars can do some of that intellectual work. But I hope we remember the many other locations in which other forms of that work is being done on the margins of our communities, for instance. Most of all, I want more indigenous scholars and non-indigenous scholars, too, to recognize what that work looks like and participate in it. Thank you. Thank you, Bowman, and I'd like to thank uh, Uncle Chegg for welcoming us all to his country. <clears throat> Last summer, the Australian government began to, ref began to refer to Indigenous Australian sovereignty. In this paper, I asked two questions. What made the Australian government refer to Indigenous sovereignty? And a much harder question, and it'll take most of my paper to answer it. What could Indigenous sovereignty be in practice? My paper is an outsider's reflection on current themes in Australian Indigenous political thought. My paper is also an attempt to make sense of the voice referendum debate, as I'm writing a book about that debate with my colleague and friend Murray Goote. And I would be very grateful for your help in writing that book. One of the most powerful elements of the campaign to vote no has been the prominent Indigenous opposition to putting the voice in the Constitution. The wider Australian public has been surprised by the referendum debate's revelation of the variety of Indigenous opinion. I'd be grateful for your comments on how I describe it in this paper. What led the Albanese government to acknowledge Indigenous sovereignty? We know that the government is wary of possible implications of the concept Indigenous sovereignty. However, it could not avoid mentioning Indigenous sovereignty as it had to try to win the support of the Australian Greens and, and thus, until she left the Greens, the support of Senator Lydia Thorpe. In August 2022, and on, perhaps on many other occasions, Thorpe said on ABC Radio, quote, some Indigenous elders see that constitutional inclusion is a sign of ceding sovereignty. The government sought to refute this idea. Senator Murray Watt, speaking on behalf of the Attorney General in November 2022, said that Indigenous acceptance of constitutional recognition does not concede Indigenous sovereignty. Megan Davis, a constitutional export, expert advising the government, was reported to say, quote, a referendum to establish a voice to parliament will not impede an unceded, unextinguished sovereignty asserted by First Nations people. As 2020, 20, as 2023 began, the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, repeated that the voice would have no impact on sovereignty. Similar assurances were given by Labor Senator Malandiri McCarthy on ABC Q&A. The government has been able to refer to Indigenous sovereignty because it is under no pressure to say what Indigenous sovereign rights are. Indigenous intellectuals, unlike the government, have good reason to explore the possible meanings of Indigenous sovereignty, but some Indigenous Australians reject sovereignty as separatism. I want now to present my provisional map of, um, yeah, this is my provisional map and I'm going to elaborate all this. The first position I'm going to describe is a position that rejects Indigenous sovereignty as divisive. In the voice referendum debate, I see Jacinta Nabinjimpa Price and Anthony Dillon as examples of this. They deny or downplay the significance of the Indigenous, non-Indigenous distinction and they are sceptical of what they see as separatist implications of Indigenous sovereignty. More than sceptical. The second position I'm going to describe is a what we call a black sovereignty position that envisages progress for Indigenous Australians through a rupture, a repudiation and radical discontinuity with the colonial past. My example is the black sovereign movement, including Lydia Thorpe and uh, 
and it is also represented by some voices coming from the tent embassy. I'll call this the radical sovereignty position because it imagines Indigenous sovereignty as a sudden rupture with the past. And the third position I'm going to describe I'll call the gradualist Indigenous rights position. All these labels are debatable. And this sees Indigenous sovereignty as growing out of revised practices of settler colonial governance, such as land and native title rights and public investment in the service delivery and representative functions of the Indigenous sector. Those Indigenous intellectuals and activists who have supported the voice come within this category. However, some who oppose the voice, such as Warren Mundine, can also be included within this strand of Indigenous thought. Before elaborating, I want to say two things about my own position. I will vote yes primarily out of respect for the Uluru Statement from the heart. <clears throat> Australia cannot recognise Indigenous Australians in, in any other terms than the terms on which they have said they wish to be recognised. Whether the voice will do all the good things expected of it remains to be seen, but it is worth a try. The second, position state, the second statement of my position that I want to make now is a methodological statement. Looking at the Indigenous world from outside, as I do, I make a methodological decision to minimise my assumptions about what is Indigenous and what is not. Accordingly, when studying Indigenous political thought, I define my data set inclusively and non-prescriptively. I avoid assuming that Indigenous political thought has any particular content. Rather, than defining Indigenous political thought by its themes, its content, I look to the identity of the person who is speaking or writing. I define Indigenous political thought by who says it. As you will see, I will include statements by Senator Jacinta Nambajimpa Price and Anthony Dillon as a strand of contemporary Australian Indigenous political thought that questions the relevance the very relevance of the term Indigenous as a political category. So let me flesh out my three-part typology. There's, firstly, there is the warning... Is, why am I so dumb at this? Oh, there we are. Yep. Um, the, the, my summary, I'm basing my summary of Anthony Dillon's views on an article he published in the Daily Telegraph on the 24th of April. 2019, which he called, or the editor called, Close the Gap on Myths. And, uh, and this is my paraphrase, though some of the words are his. Uh, the myth that only Aboriginal people are expert on Aboriginal affairs and only Aboriginal affairs. Adults, uh, sorry, and only, ad, ab, let me read that again. The myth that only Aboriginal people are expert on Aboriginal affairs and only Aboriginal adults can raise an Aboriginal child. The myth that government is totally to blame for the problems facing Aboriginal people. Aboriginal contribution to improvement is also vital. The myth that we cannot move forward until this country acknowledges the atrocities of the past and that Aboriginal people are victims of colonisation. The myth that Aboriginal people are an homogeneous group with all members equally disadvantaged. Many are thriving. And when we speak of closing the gap, let's focus on those who are most disadvantaged. A failure to challenge these myths gives a green light for the Uluru Statement from the Heart, he went on to say, which, quote, serves to distract from the important issues facing Aboriginal people, like the need for employment, job readiness, good schools, ready access to modern services and good housing. In 2022, Dylan, Anthony Dillon published another essay, The Voice, Self-Determination or Separatism? The problem with self-determination policy, he argued, is that it assumes that Indigenous Australians are essentially different from other Australians and essentially similar to each other. This has led to self-determination policies which, in Dillon's view, have weakened many individuals' access to education and employment. According to Dillon, <clears throat> Indigenous Australians are divided. The leaders of the Yes campaign, he says, are those who somehow escaped the flawed policies of collective self-determination. 
They grasp education and employment opportunities despite the programs of self-determination, not because of them. Dylan worries that an Indigenous voice will empower those, these successful Indigenous people to entrench a policy paradigm that is failing other Indigenous people. If anyone needs a voice, he says, it is the Indigenous Australians whose lives are much worse than the lives of the voice advocates. Now to Jacinta Price. As a National Party Senator, Jacinta Price's ideas include some that I see as typical of the Nationals' conservative populist rhetoric. Thus, Senator Price repeatedly positions herself as a regional critic of urban elites. In the Indigenous context, that regionalist anti-elitism anti gets a particular inflection. Price as the champion of abused women and children who cannot gain the attention of the powerful. She says we should amplify the regions so we can hear the unheard. But Price and the Nationals have not endorsed the Liberals' proposal of a legislated regional voice. So it is not clear how she would amplify the cries of the unheard. The constitutionally enshrined voice is likely to be a bureaucracy, she says, controlled by those whom she called in her recent National Press Club speech, the Qantas sponsored leaders of the activist industry. She blames indigenous policy failure on these elites and activists. Price is ambivalent about whether we should characterize the regions in cultural terms, however. On the one hand, social policy should address people according to their needs not according to their distinct culture and historical experiences, she says. On the other hand, she presents a cultural explanation of the problems of Indigenous remote communities. She said in her press club speech on the 13th of September that Aboriginal people are not victims of colonisation and are not suffering intergenerational trauma. Rather, their lives are blighted by, quote, something much closer to home the tendencies towards violence that have continued from pre-colonial Aboriginal society. In campaigning for a no vote, Price has invited admiring attention to her own family. She grew up in a household in Alice Springs rather than in the remote community, Yundamu, of her mother's Walbury kin. And both she and her mother have married non-Aboriginal men. She has presented her family as paradigmatic of a nation threatened by indigenous separatism. So that's the first school of thought. The second um, uh, position is the black sovereignty position. I'm going to talk about that at some length. In February 2023, Senator Lydia Thorpe left the Australian Greens and announced herself as a leader of the black sovereignty movement. In parliamentary debate on the referendum bill on 16th of June, she moved an amendment, quote, Nothing in this act shall be taken to cede or disturb the sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people means an unceded right held in collective possession by the members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations, which confers usage, access and custodianship to the lands, waters and natural resources of what is now known as Australia and the right of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to exercise an unimpeded and collective self-determination, uh, self-determinate self governance over their political and economic and social affairs. So that's a long quote, but you'll be familiar what, with her thoughts, I think. And I want to make two comments on it. Firstly, although she has sometimes spoken as if she believes that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, encodes Indigenous rights. Thorpe has not commented on the fact that UNDRIP makes no reference to sovereignty other than to say that Indigenous people's self-determination should do nothing to, quote, dismember or impair totally or in part the territorial integrity or political unity of sovereign and independent states. UNDRIP would require that First Nations sovereignty coexist with and pragmatically accept Australian sovereignty by working within the affordances of Australia's constitutions and laws. I am not sure that Thorpe acknowledges this, for her formulation of Indigenous sovereignty includes these words, quote, sovereignty has never been ceded, our sovereignty does not coexist with the sovereignty of the Crown, end of quote. 
By repudiating political strategies that would work within Australia's legal framework, the black sovereigns distinguish themselves from other visions of Indigenous sovereignty. One is Michael Mansell's. Mansell argues that Australia's constitution already includes authority which, if used in certain ways, would benefit Indigenous Australia. He has argued that the Commonwealth Parliament legislate to create an additional Senate seat from each state to be elected by Indigenous voters. He has also proposed that under Section 121 of the Constitution, the Federal Parliament could create a seventh state of Australia, its territory combining all Aboriginal lands, as long as the owners consented. So Mansell is therefore an opponent of the voice because he thinks it's not, it's not doing anything that can't be done already, and these are the valuable things that could be done already. Others have seen potential in Australian federalism, arguing that there is no constitutional barrier to adapt federalism so that some government functions could be delegated to Indigenous governing bodies. As Alison Vivian and her co-authors at the Jambana House of Learning wrote in 2017, quote, divided sovereignty, shared jurisdiction, and a capacity to evolve in response to changing community values are fundamental attributes of federation. My second comment on the black sovereignty position is that it envisages a clean and perfect rupture from all that has taken place in Indigenous affairs policy until now. Thorpe has labelled native title an insult. She said of the parliament, and she said of the parliament, quote, not one piece of legislation that has ever come out of this place has been good for us. You know why? Because it's deliberate. It's deliberate. This place is here because they need to get rid of the black problem." End of quote. What would make it a rupture between a totally bad past, as envisaged in these words, and a brighter future? As I understand the black sovereign position, and I don't know that I do understand it very well, the rupture would be affected by truth-telling, a process of enlightenment that would leave Australians with such a sense of collective shame that they would sign a treaty establishing First Nations sovereignty in whatever terms First Nations wanted. This scenario lacks political imagination. Hoping for a moment of settler colonial awakening, confession and collective self-perfection, Thorpe implicitly denies history as a flow, as a, con as a continuity, as um, a a flow of events occasionally punctuated by moments of crisis, negotiation, compromise and settler colonial concessions in law and institutional design. In its refusal of the messiness of politics, Thorpe's understanding of human history is more religious than secular. A recent influential approach to the study of history in Australia supports this failure to imagine political progress as the slow grind that it is. This approach to history delivers a totalising narrative. Australian history as wholly adverse, unrelieved by moments of negotiated reform. This view of history sees no potential in recent settler colonial ideologies and practices such as recognition. So here is Irene Watson on recognition. Quote, it should be clear that there are no remedies in the recognition game it is like the game of snakes and ladders, which goes up and down, but leads to only one ending. Our assimilation into the white Australian nation. Genocide. There is currently no other alternative on offer. End of quote. In recent Australian historical scholarship, the idea that a settler colonial society could take any steps that are genuinely progressive has been under suspicion from historians and political scientists of the, of the settler colonial studies approach. This aligns with indigenous scepticism that Australia could ever overcome its original sin. To quote Irene Watson again, the current discussion in Australia about possible constitutional recognition of First Nations is out there for public consumption in an electorate noted for its conservatism. What it means beyond the terra nullius narrative is yet unknown, but there is little to suggest that it means much more than the continuation of that same narrative, the terra, nullia, the terra nullius body dressed in the costume of recognition." End of quote. So that completes my exposition of the 
the black sovereignty position. Now I want to talk about what I call the First Nations so sovereign practices evolving position. There has to be a better phrase than that. In contrast with black sovereignty, imagining of a rupture with the past, the strand that I now wish to describe imagines Indigenous sovereignty as evolving from the opportunity structures of reformed settler colonial government. That is, this vision of sovereignty arises from reflection on the practices enabled by imperfect laws, such as the Aboriginal Councils and Associations Act 1976 and its successor, the Corporation's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act 2006 the various state and territory land rights acts and the native title act 1993 consider the following contrast on the one hand the black sovereigns say land rights are central to our sovereignty native title is not land rights our struggle for real land rights is an assertion of our sovereignty end of quote on, on the other hand, others see native title legislation as the fruitful context in which First Nations capacities for sovereignty can be nurtured. This way of thinking gained academic impetus over 20 years ago when Marcia Langton and her colleagues at the University of Melbourne joined with the Commonwealth Agency then called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Services in an ARC linkage project called Agreements, Treaties and Negotiated Settlements in settler states, their role and relevance for Indigenous and other Australians, with Marcia Langton as chief investigator. That project resulted in two collections of case studies and reflection on the negotiation of Indigenous rights. I'll refer to it as the Negotiated Settlements Project, just to keep things simple. Because it demonstrated how to substantiate Indigenous sovereignty in theory and practice, the Negotiated Settlements Project is central, in my opinion, to the intellectual heritage of Indigenous studies in Australia. In a 2002 paper, Professor Langton celebrated agreements signed under the Native Title Act uh, th that they acknowledged, quote, the ancient identities of nations such as the Wik, the Thayora and the Agnith. She referred to Indigenous signatories as, quote, Aboriginal nations, and she wrote, quote, corporations acknowledge that pre-existing Aboriginal polities exist as a profound reality in our political and economic landscape. The constitution does not. In other words, she differentiated between two interlocutors of the Indigenous, private resource-based corporations and governments, finding the corporations to be more amenable to the recognition of native title. She hoped that, in this 2002 essay, that constitutional amendment would eventually acknowledge, quote, the pre-existing Aboriginal polities or Aboriginal nations, end of quote. As we now see, 20 years later, proposals for amending the Australian constitution have taken another form, not the constitutional acknowledgement of First Nations as sovereigns, but the inscription of an Indigenous voice that would advise the Commonwealth Parliament and Executive. However, there is continuity between these two imaginings of constitutional recognition. The continuity is in the commitment to Indigenous regionalism, a commitment sustained also in the practice of ATSIC in the, between the years 1990 and 2004. The Negotiated Settlements Project argued that the practice of native title, especially after the Howard government's 1998 amendments to the Act, was a stimulus to the reformation of Aboriginal polities. And here's a quote. In the minimal form of Aboriginal landholding corporation, we find that governance and dominion, such as those rights of possession asserted among Aboriginal groups in disputes over territory, are achieved both within and between such groups. As a result, we find that there are transactions that may be construed as governance in a larger entity than the clan itself. That is, Professor Langton argued that the assertion of customary law in matters of land title is one stimulus of the capacity and will to act regionally. 
the negotiating settlements project concluded that, quote, the making of agreements has become the principal form of engagement between Indigenous nations and the modern nation state. As well, the negotiated settlements project never lost sight of the fact that Indigenous Australians deal not only with governments, but also with non-Indigenous corporations. Confronted by both corporations and government agencies, Indigenous polities have not always had the human and material resources that they need. In 2015, Professor Langton reflected on the vicissitudes of these customary polities in a paper about registered native title bodies, also known as prescribed bodies corporate, which hold native title, and native title representative bodies, which administer native title matters on a regional basis. She described PBCs as burdened and under-resourced. She warned against assuming that because PBCs are rooted in Aboriginal customary law, they possess sufficient social capital to do all that is expected of them. There was a danger of excessive localization and thus of, quote, balkanization. To work well as polities, what she referred to as old forms of social organization would have to do new things such as forge regional alliances. She applauded those native title holders who were seeking, quote, economies of scale through, quote, regional governance bodies. And she saw hope in the regionalist visions of native title representative bodies. She pointed to the, quote, conflicting values at work, traditional values to stay local on the one hand and the pressures of the organisational world on the other. And she exhorted Aboriginal, pe quote, Aboriginal people themselves to change their mindset about the highly local, localised social world that they prefer and make a decision to escalate their administrative organisational capacity to a much higher level than they are accustomed to. End of quote. When the Morrison government commissioned Professor Langton and Professor Tom Calmer to design an Indigenous voice to Parliament, their design emphasised the local regional foundations of the voice. The boundaries of the 35 voices would be determined by discussion between governments and Indigenous organisations. Then, in each region, either a voice would be designed from scratch or, much more likely, from existing Indigenous organisations in that region, such as those concerned with land rights and native title matters or organisations delivering services those organisations would be adapted to become the voice in that region. Each regional voice would, quote, build on and leverage existing approaches wherever possible, with adaptation and evolution as needed. Karma and Langton declined to present a blueprint of local and regional voices, instead suggesting nine guiding design principles for the 35 regions to apply. By this continuity with regionally accepted practices and personnel, the 35 local and regional voices would acquire legitimacy in Indigenous eyes, they thought. One of the least known features of the Karma Langton final report is that it presents the legitimacy of the national voice as derivative of, derivative of quote, the strength, legitimacy and authority of local and regional voices, end of quote. They recommended that the national voice not come into operation, quote, until the, the vast majority of local and regional voices are fully established. This vision of regionalism is descended, I would argue, from the regionalism that ATSIC practised and that the negotiated settlement research project theorised as the practice of land rights and native title. That completes my exposition of the three um, positions. I now want to say something about the way that uh, Indigenous diversity has been reflected in the uh, d debate about the voice. The content, thank you. The contest between the yes and no campaigns has been an opportunity for the Australian public to learn about Indigenous political diversity. However, the yes no contest is a misleading guide to that diversity. For example, the yes-no divide obscures the common ground between Senator Price and Noel Pearson. Both Pearson and Price argue that social policy should pay attention to socioeconomic need and not assume that Indigenous needs are distinct in causation and solution. Both Pearson and Price were very critical of the Albanese government's abolition of the cashless debit card. 
Jacinta Price wins the applause of some conservative Australians by urging a critical appraisal of Indigenous custom. But she is not the only Indigenous person to ind urge Indigenous Australians to allow space for, the criti for critically assessing the claims of custom. Revision of custom is part of Langton's project as well. Indeed, critical appraisal of custom is a feature of all First Nations building projects, I would say, and nation building is the concern of people on both sides of the referendum debate. Warren Mundine is a no campaigner, but he also advocates that First Nations be recognised by treaties with Australian governments. And Mundine's practice, of course, comes out of uh, native title. He's a chief executive officer of NTS Corp, with the native title service provider for New South Wales and ACT. So his f approach to sovereignty can be said to be a product of the practice of native title. Mundine argues that there will be a straighter and shorter path to treaties with First Nations if there is no national representative Indigenous voice in the Constitution. If Indigenous studies is to be useful, it should continue to support research on First Nation building. It is probably not necessary for me to say that, but I wanted to say it. <clears throat> I acknowledge that there are people in this room who know a lot more than I do about the contemporary theory and practice of Indigenous nation building. And here is a recent example, which I want, I've recently read, the, 19, the 2022 PhD thesis of Janine Gertz. And Janine has given me permission to discuss her work in this forum. The task of Janine's thesis is to, quote, operationalise Gugu Badun, Badun uh, political autonomy inside and outside the legal and politically constituted order of the Australian state. Practices of sovereignty and self-determination will grow from the specific history and contemporary conditions of each First Nation, she says. Those practices will contain elements of reconciliation, recognition and refusal. Now, one of one of Goetz's aims is to develop the vocabulary of Indigenous political theory. For example, her discussion of the difference between an agonistic and an and a antagonistic relationship between Gugu Badun, political autonomy, and Australian state, state sovereignty. And in a brief summary, I cannot do justice to her setting out of such concepts. What I can do is tell you what she means when she says that the Australian state will need to recognise Gugu Badun's sovereignty on some practical level. What practices might Gugu Badun develop and assert for state recognition? Well, she nominates four. Uh, developing and implementing a political constitution, drawing up community planning documents, recording cultural history and language revitalisation, and doing a population census leading to a whole of community wellbeing program. Goetz's thesis is prospective. To quote her, it is less about what Gugu Badun was or is, but what it could be. I'd like to conclude by mentioning four issues that seem to me to be among the current concerns of Indigenous political thought. And in a way, I've touched on them already. So this is just a drawing together by way of conclusion. Firstly, the first issue is how to characterise the laws that have enabled Indigenous land, the, that have enabled the Indigenous land and sea estate. Are the land rights and native title laws the context for the formation of nations? Or are they an elaborate trap because of their many constraints and stipulations and an, an insult, using Lydia Thorpe's term, to Indigenous sovereigns? Secondly, at what scale can Indigenous representation operate? Some would agree with Warren Mundine that there, can be no, that there can be no effective representation of Indigenous interests above the level of the First Nation. That is no national body. Others argue that a national representative body is both possible and necessary. Thirdly, what is the relationship between citizenship within a First Nation and Australian citizenship? This question arises when Indigenous Australians debate whether access to welfare should be contingent on the approval of local Indigenous authorities, as along the lines of the model that they've set up in Cape York. This question also arises in debates about what role, if any, 
Indigenous community organisation should play in the, authentic, in the authentication of the Indigenous identity of, uh, of, of individuals. Fourthly, what policy should First Nations adopt towards multiple membership or multiple citizenship? Because you will be familiar that many people are represented to us as belonging to more than one nation. It's, a, it's now very, very common. So that's really all I've got to offer. I just want to say that I think that in Indigenous studies could make a, a, a great contribution to political life in this country by debating such questions and so developing contemporary Indigenous political thought. <laughs>